What's going on, Drinking Buddies? Brand new podcast coming right at you. But real quick, you know what we got to do first. We got to talk about sponsors and things that bring money. First and foremost, big news. The video versions of this podcast are now available on the Patreon at awd.net slash Patreon. The video store will be discontinued on Vimeo as of October 1st. All existing video content will be transferred over to the Patreon. Any new video content will be on the Patreon. So please come support us on Patreon at awd.net slash Patreon. All sorts of goodies, not just, and now we drink goodies, my random musings, videos, and all sorts of exclusive content will be available on the Patreon. I'm updating it regularly. Come hang out. We are also brought to you this week by my Twitch stream. That's right. Since the pandemic started, I've been Twitch streaming. Come hang in the chat. Make me do some shots. Let's go have some fun at twitch.tv slash Slayer. Once again, that is twitch.tv slash Slayer. If you're listening to this on Thursday, there is my community game night where we play Goose Goose Duck every Thursday at 7 p.m. PST. Come hang out. And if you're a member of the Discord and you've hung out a bit and we got to know you, come play. It's a lot of fucking fun. And last but not least, we were brought to you by my Amazon affiliate link. I know you're buying shit on Amazon. I know. I know you are. So do me a huge solid. Click on the link in the description before you make your purchases. That way I get a little bit of a kickback. Costs you nothing but just a little clicky click click. So check that out in the show notes. Please click the affiliate link. All right. That's it for money stuff. My guest this week is legendary LA comic Murray Valeriano. For some of you old school listeners, you remember Murray was on during LA Podfest. We finally got him on for a full episode and we go all over the place. We get pretty dark. We talk about the recent fentanyl overdoses that have been happening in LA, some other dark shit. We talk about Murray's time partying in Hollywood. He used to live in this neighborhood. He thinks he may have actually done drugs in my apartment before I lived here. Who fucking knows? But Murray was an absolute treat to have on. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. But in the meantime, sit back, relax, pop a cold one, and enjoy drinking buddies. I don't know what I could what I, what I could say. Are you? I'm not getting myself. Or are you getting me? Test, test, test. Okay, there we go. Yeah, right, great. yeah, I'm awesome. getting you. Okay, good, good, good. And I'm definitely bleeding onto your mic a little bit. So <laughs> good times there. <laughs> You're gonna have to put a wall. One of those uh, a a COVID cu- walls. A COVID wall or a cubicle <laughs> to somebody like, to say. The, like figure out how to put a camera like over it. There'll be a weird <laughs> top down angle on somebody. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's the, that's the angle for selfies is always from the top. Well, yeah. Especially I'm a fat guy. I, I, I know. I know. <laughs> Hell, I think I tried to shoot a picture with you and I at LA Podfest where I didn't shoot top down and you yelled at me about it. Oh yeah, dude. I'm very vain. <laughs> I'm extremely, <laughs> I'm way too old to be as vain as I am. <laughs> You should have heard Murray when he came in and you saw cameras. He's like, the fuck? Like, what? What? Wait, what? This is on video? Because <laughs> I listened to the audio version. I, I didn't realize you had uh, started the video version. Yeah, only like two years ago. Uh, <laughs> dude, I don't watch podcasts. I listen to podcasts. I listen to And what I noticed is I, I don't even listen to them when I'm not on the road. Like, I, I haven't listened. I realized I didn't listen to any podcast on lockdown for months and months. And then I just started running at night. And so I started watching them again, uh, listening to them again. No, I'm right there with you. Like, I was traveling a lot, and that's why I was listening to podcasts. And now it's like uh, YouTube. YouTube content is what I will binge while I'm sitting at home. And I will watch people's clips, but not full episodes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the other thing I do with podcasts I notice, too, is if I listen to a podcast, and I don't like if I listen to uh, like Jimmy Dore on Rogan or something like that, and it, if I don't get to it, I don't go back. I don't, if I don't finish them, I don't go back. It's a weird, weird habit. I don't know why. I feel like that habit happens for more people than they like to admit, even though I tell everyone like, oh, it's okay if your podcast is long. People can go back to them. <laughs> yeah, I'd never go back. But that's what I like about those long podcasts, especially when I'm on the road traveling. Like I can do, bury three hours in, in a long podcast, no problem. But if I'm out for like a 30-minute run and I listen to 30 minutes of uh, 
and now we drink, man, I'm not coming back. <laughs> hey, whatever. 30 minutes of you. I, Absol- I'm, I'll, yes, absolutely. It's all about the numbers. I don't care if anyone actually listens to this. Were you podcasting when Libsyn was the big host for the longest time? I'm still on Libsyn. Okay. All right. They, they stopped counting their numbers differently. Were you around for that? Oh, yeah. Oh, and then I saw everybody them. went to a quarter of what they thought they had. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially because I talked to Rob Walsh, who's the. I know Rob. He's yeah. a great guy. Great guy. I talked to Rob about that at LA Podfest 17. Like, okay. My numbers halved. What the fuck? He's like, well, that's because you're an over two hour podcast and players were queuing it twice. So like, but, 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 <laughs> advertise. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been like the stock market crash of like 98 or 88 or something like that. Podcasters jumping out the window. <laughs> Well, especially when you're you know, a mid-tier podcaster such as myself, like every one of those fucking numbers count. Oh, like, sure. If Rogan has 50,000 people fall off, it's like, eh. Yeah, he barely, doesn't even notice. <laughs> right. I have 2,000 people fall off. I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing with my life? <laughs> fuck. Fuck. I've dedicated so much time and money and alcohol to this. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Well, you know, the alcohol is well spent. The money for the alcohol anyway. Yeah, yeah. I broke out the good stuff from Murray today, but you won't have any of it. I am a, you caught me in a weird spot where I'm on the wagon. I'm on the, I'm a big I'm a single malt scotch guy. I'm, I'm on the wagon. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not in recovery. I didn't do it in AA. I just, I was touring so much and I was drinking so much that it's a little bit of a story here. I was two years ago. I was on the road. I was on the road basically every week up until Christmas Eve. I actually drove home in the middle of the night to be home on Christmas Eve for my kid. And I was just drinking so much that I'm like, I got to go on the wagon, man. I just got to go. Because comedy clubs are a glorified bar. You know that. <laughs> That's really all they are. And especially if the owner shows up that night and he wants to impress everybody, you're drinking great goose out of the bottle, you know. So I decided I'd, t- I'd just take a break. And I took a break. And then I ended up, uh, I'll stop after I stopped touring at, and I'll start at Christmas. And then Christmas came around. And I was like, ah, if I start drinking now, I'm really going to, I'm really going to fucking drink. So I'm like, you know what? Beginning of the year. Beginning of the year, the way I can say I didn't drink. Come to the beginning of the year, you're like, you know what? I'm feeling good. When I have something to celebrate, when I have something to celebrate, then the fucking pandemic hit. And I'm like, all right, pandemic will probably last like two weeks. I don't think it's a good idea for me to start drinking when I'm stuck in the house with my family. Here we are almost two years later. <laughs> I'm still not drinking. So whenever this pandemic, maybe I'll come on here. Whenever this pandemic comes on, I'm getting a fucking bottle of 25 year old McAllen and I'm going to town, dude. All right. Uh, I'll pencil it in for like <laughs> 2027 or so. Oh, this pandemic isn't going. I'm going to have to rethink my plan. <laughs> well, if you're going back to the celebration plan, you are celebrating. You're here. Come on. <laughs> I am. Ce- Dude, I told you when I walked in, I like I lived in the, when I moved to California, I lived up the street from here. I flashed back to early 20s, Murray. Just fuck it. I, I told you, I took a bus from that corner to Brentwood to a table waiting job with a transvestite hooker named Como Sava. I don't even know what transvestite hookers call themselves anymore. I don't know if that's still the term. Uh, yeah, I shot a uh, pool with Vivian Campbell, who's the guitar player for Def Leppard around the corner from here. There used to be a Thai restaurant with a Thai Elvis impersonator. That still happens. Oh, it's still here? It's still here, and that still happens on Wednesdays. <laughs> that's awesome. Way to give away exactly where I live. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Whatever, right? <laughs> I've mentioned Tommy's is around the corner a hundred okay, times okay, on air, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I, flash it. I love this neighborhood so much. This is great, and it's really... I was telling you too, like Hollywood apartments have their own architecture and decor. Like, I, I mean, as soon as I walked in, I was like, oh yeah, I remember this. I'm a fucking, <laughs> I'm an, I'm an uptight West side person now. Like I don't have any fun anymore. <laughs> see, see, I, I'm planning to be a Hollywood guy until I die. Absolutely. Go for, we need you. We need you people. We need you people. <laughs> I mean, they need me for the liquor sales at least. <laughs> yeah, so he's got to keep the business booming. <laughs> All right, I'm supporting my local bars. I'm actually should be wearing a local bar hat, but I can't find it. What are the local bars here? Uh, um, you go to my local haunt is Lost Property over at Hollywood and Vine. Okay, okay, Hollywood and Vine. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah. Kind of a little speakeasy cocktail bar. Uh huh. Like you know where Thirty Three Taps used to be, right on the corner. Yeah, yeah. You go around the corner. There's a recessed door. Oh, nice. And it's. Small, dimly lit room with craft cocktails. Oh, nice. It kind of reminded that Swingers line in Swingers where like all the good bars in Hollywood don't have signs on their doors. Yeah. I'm, gl- I'm glad that's still a thing, man. Oh, it, it's a, it was such a mixed bag for me because I want that bar to succeed. I love it. I love the sure. staff. And they started like opening the door, putting a sandwich sign out on Vine to like get people in. And I'm like, but that kind of ruins the mystique a little bit. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of women that I should not have been able to bed by impressing them and be like, I know this bar exists. <laughs> oh, you mean the one by the sandwich board? Boner killer. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm trying to think of the dives I used to, the Powerhouse, which I think is still there over on Hollywood and Vine. Uh, Hollywood Highland. Hollywood Highland. Yeah, the Powerhouse is still there? Uh, its signage is still there. I don't know if okay. it actually survived the pandemic. Uh, oh, that's true. I'm thinking pre-pandemic here. Um, coaching Horses, that's long gone, I think. What was the... I mean, there's Bronson Bar over at Bronson and Sunset. Yeah, that came in. Yeah, that was a little high. That was a little... When it first opened, it was a little too high end for because i really like the dive i ended up dating a comic a chick uh in the valley so i was hitting the starlight and uh the back door and all those dive bars in the valley which i really love uh, bronson's pretty divey these days is well, it <laughs> actually it's been closed since covid but pre-covid it's like oh this was nice decor but it's pretty fucking divey oh, okay good 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 yeah i remember when that opened i remember that open and then um I'm afraid to give off all the, I don't want to give it where you live, but then birds became my, which isn't really a bar. It's a bar restaurant, but it became, it was literally, we, I moved up at the top of Beachwood and you could take a, a dash bus for 50 cents that stopped right in front of my apartment and went right to birds. So I could just go day drink all day, pay 50 cents and get a ride home. <laughs> up, up this I used to, oh, I used to use it. I don't like to, I'm married now, happily married, uh, I don't like it, but I used to be like, meet girls at birds and be like, Hey, you know, there's this dash bus you can ride for like 50 cents. Like what? No, come on. <laughs> it's okay. You would not be the first or last guest to be like, honey, I love you, but this all happened before we <laughs> met. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Don't worry. My, my wife's got her own stories too. I'm sure. I hope. <laughs> Do you want to marry a square? Who's got no stories? <laughs> I married a nun. It was weird. Picked her right up at the covenant. Right. Her away. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like, come on. I can show you a better life. I'm a recovering born again, Christian. I'll show you how to live. <laughs> and then you went sober. Like, like, this isn't what I signed up for. <laughs> many <laughs> wild times. Many, many years later. Many years later. And by the way, I don't, I, I, I protest the term sober. I prefer on a break. Uh huh. Like Ross and Rachel, like on a break. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm on a break. No, I'm going back to drinking. I, I did a, uh, uh, AA, like an a big AA convention out in the valley or AA room performed there. And right after I hopped on the wagon and I was like, I told him like, yeah, I stopped drinking. They were like, yeah. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm just visiting. I'm just visiting. I'll be back on. And they also, I'm just seeing night. how the other half lives. Right. <laughs> but it's funny. It's when you do tell people you're not drinking, it, their response is always like, oh, sorry. Do you have a problem? I'm, I'm only drinking. I'm like, no, dude, I, I no, I'm just, it's, I, I don't want to get fat. Cause I'm sitting around the house for two years. I don't, that's the only reason that's the only reason. vanity. It goes back to vanity. For, no, I, for me, you. for me, it goes back to vanity. For I, I put on so much fucking weight during COVID. And the funny thing is I didn't, I only really drink when I'm streaming or doing this. Uh -huh. Like when I'm not out being sociable, a lot of mushrooms during COVID. Oh yeah. 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 I bet. I bet. <laughs> like tripping by myself. That's fine. <laughs> you know, I never. I had a friend who used to like, he'd be like, what are you doing tonight? I uh, take some mushrooms and go watch law and order. I'm like by yourself. <laughs> like, but now I get it. I get it too. And believe me, there's times where like, Oh, I want to trip and be social. And they're like, I hate tripping with you. I love you to death, but I hate tripping with you. Oh, why? They hate tripping with you. Well, no, I hate tripping with. Them. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, you're ruining my fucking trip. Just oh, please shut the fuck up for <laughs> five seconds. <laughs> I had one. One bad trip on mushrooms at Coachella. Oh no. Coachella. I was, first of all, if you ask, even if you ask my girlfriend today, she will think I just had some bad pizza and wasn't feeling well. <laughs> she had no idea that both. Does, does the wife know about your girlfriend today? <laughs> right. That's the only thing that's going to get isolated. <laughs> <laughs> I meant, if you ask my girlfriend from then today, she still doesn't know what happened, but we went to Coachella and, um, my friend, she, and this was, this was, she was like, she was one of those, uh, people who were like, we'd go out at night and she's like, we're going to go out drinking, but you better not do drugs with your friends. And I'm like, all right. And then she'd get two drinks in and she'd be like, Hey, do you think your friend has any Coke? You know, like that kind of, I'm like, all right. <laughs> so she's like, I'll go to Coachella, but you guys don't, I don't want you guys to do drugs. And I'm like, all right, fine. And so we go to the beer garden and she goes to get beer. And my buddy's like, Hey man, I got these mushrooms. Uh, I've had them forever. I doubt they're even potent. Do you, do you want them? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So we sp sprinkled them on the pizza and ate them. Forget about it. Two hours later, three hours later, we're in like four people away from the Foo Fighters. They're headlining. They're one of the headliners. No, Oasis was headlining, but they're prime eight o'clock slot. And we're thousands of people in. And my buddy is six foot four, 280 pounds. And these mushrooms just fucking kick in like i like i'd forgotten about it like that's how tame they were and they just all of a sudden the foo fighters come out the bass is like 
it, like I feel it in my face, you know, like, like, why are my eyes bulging right now? And then I'm like, wow, Dave Grohl has a cool sparkly shirt on. And they're like, oh shit, this is the mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot I'd taken him. Right. And so then my buddy, six foot four, two, we called him Chewbacca. He's like, I don't feel good. And I'm like, me neither. I think it's some mushrooms. <laughs> He's like, no, I really don't feel good. And then his eyes just glaze over and he passes out. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody faint. They, they're dead in their eyes. Yeah. Their eyes just go dead. And I'm like, peak top peak. And I'm freaking the fuck out. Like this guy's dead. My girlfriend at the time is like, what's going on? Bad pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so I run over to the, there's there's like a middle aisle that's left open so the tech guys can cut through the crowd and go to the sound booth. And I go over to the guy, I'm like, dude, my buddy just passed out. I think he's going to die. He's like, I don't care. <laughs> like, I got to get him over the rail. He's like, you know, come over the rail, you're getting arrested. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I drag him out of these thousands of people. I get him out into the, the white, you know, Coachella is in a polo field. And so there's all these horse divots if they didn't fill it in. And I get her, I get my friend out, open to an open field with one person in the middle of the field who tripped in a divot and broke her ankle. And she's screaming and crying in the middle of the thing. And I'm like, I don't know if you know about the Altamont uh, Speedway concert of 69 where they hired the Hells Angels. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I'm like, this is Altamont all over again. <laughs> like, <this> is, <laughs> we're all going to die, man. We're all going to die. And so finally we run into a friend of mine and I'm like, we'll call him Matt. <laughs> Matt passed out. He's, I don't know what's happening. I gotta get the fuck out of here, man. I'm freaking out. And so I grabbed my girlfriend at the time and, uh, <laughs> and we walk to the side of the hill on the porta potty. And I just watched, there's like a, a row of 50 porta potties on each side. So there's like a row of porta potties. And I just watched people and listened to the doors click open and close. Tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 for like 45 minutes until I came down. And then just randomly the manager from the improv showed up and it kind of like brought me back to reality. Uh, oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> this could affect my career. How I know it. I got sober up here. <laughs> Yeesh. That was, the only, that was the only mushroom, bad mushroom trip I, I think I ever had. And it wasn't even bad. It was just circumstantial. Yeah. I think it would have been fine. Maybe, you know. Then guy, by yourself, you would have been okay. Yeah. I mean, he could have turned down the bass a little bit, but <laughs> other than that. <laughs> Murray just being an audiophile while he's <laughs> tripping. The funny thing is there's a great uh, Foo Fighters documentary called Back and Forth, and they talk about that Coachella show because they had broken up or they were about to break up before they played Coachella, and they played Coachella and had such a good show that they stayed together. Little do they know that my life almost ended. I don't know if it almost ended. It's all your fault, Murray. They, <laughs> they saw you this guy like, oh, that guy's so passionate about, you know, his dragging his friend out, but he wants to be on the show. He's screaming. <laughs> oh, we got to stay together for fans like that. You know what? The, you know what the worst part was? They had, I forgot about it. They had tech issues. So they were, let's say they're supposed to go on a, this is the heat. This So they weren't at eight o'clock. They were probably about four o'clock. So this is 110 degrees. They're supposed to go on at four. They can go on at six. So we're standing in the heat the whole time. The mushrooms are kicking in. They Somehow they convinced Tenacious D to do a set. And then Jack Black practically falls off the stage. <laughs> it, it, it was a, Everybody else had a good time except me and my friend, Sean, Matt. Sean, Matt. Sean, Matt. <laughs> Sean, Matt. <laughs> Sean, Matt. <laughs> Things I will not be cleaning up in post. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I don't. I think he's good with it. He's. Heard, he, I've told that story several times. I think he's good with it. <laughs> it's, it's your story, too. You can tell. That's it. right. I saved his fucking life. <laughs> right? You just didn't leave him there to die. I know. I could have. <laughs> you could have absolutely no, just been like, no, I'm enjoying the show, man. He's 6'4", cool. too. Nobody's crowd surfing that guy. So <laughs> they would have just stepped all over him. Prop him up against the fence and... Any bad mushroom trips here in the apartment? No, no, thankfully. A uh, couple times where we're like, oh, I, I think I'm dying. And then it's just like, oh, I'm on mushrooms. I'm just, just ride it out. I'm, I'm ex experienced enough psycho not at this point to just be like, nope, just got to ride this out. Body will metabolize it. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was always good about, all right, chill, dude. It's the acid. You know, I was always really good about talking myself down from those, those trips. All right, just, just relax. It'll just be over in a bit. Just chill. Enjoy the ride. Exactly. That's all you got to do. And I have friends who are inexperienced who are like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm afraid of having a bad trip. I'm like, well, if you're in that headspace, yeah, I'm very well may. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can talk yourself right into it. But you just have to remind yourself, your body will metabolize it. It will be over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was always really good about that, man. It was always those palpitations on the other stuff that always freaked me out <laughs> a little bit. Oh, well, yeah, especially if you ended up with heart problems. <laughs> yeah, surprisingly, had nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> You sure? 
Did you fully no. disclose that to your doctor? Uh, I fully believe that my uh, uh, lifetime of suppressing my feelings and emotions had everything to do with my heart valve. <laughs> Just gave way. Just said, fuck it, dude. We're out. Poof. <laughs> no, the, the funny thing about that heart thing is like, I stopped doing drugs. I stopped smoking cigarettes. I stopped partying. I, I got really healthy. And then my fucking heart valve takes a shit and I have to have open heart surgery. <laughs> well, and that's why. Like your body got in the rhythm from the drugs. <laughs> oh, that, maybe that's it. <laughs> this is why I don't stop. <laughs> oh, right. Because I'm like, uh, if I stop drinking in caffeine, my body will be like, dude, we ha- we haven't run clean in like 20, 30 years. Oh, so you think it has, because you know, like <clears throat> when people get off heroin and they go back, they start where they left off and that's what usually kills them. Right. So you think it has the reverse to where if you stop, your body's like, wait, we can't handle this either. So yeah, like raw dog in reality. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh man, I'm not a. I, I, that's the one thing I always stayed away from was heroin. Yeah, and then same opiates in general. Like, I, I am. I'll admit this on air. Mm-hmm. I am, especially at a younger age, absolutely terrified of inter- intravenous needles. Like, oh, okay, yeah. I I had to be restrained by nurses as a child to have drawn blood, <laughs> like blood drawn and shit. And the idea of like when heroin was going around in high school, a bunch of my friends ended up using it. It's like, nope, nope. I couldn't even like watch Travolta shoot up in Pulp Fiction. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even get like I didn't even get I I I made I did the math early on. I I, I measured the amount of deaths caused by heroin and the amount of great albums by the Rolling Stones <laughs> caused by heroin. So we're looking at ten good albums to thousands and thousands of deaths. So I'm like, I'm gonna stay away. I'm gonna stay away. And a lot of talented comics taken out by it too. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent. So, I, you know, I take it back. I smoked it once. It was laced with in a, in a joint. I remember it at band camp in high school. Um, but that's it. That's, and that was just stumbled upon. And that was, and I didn't even like that once I, when I didn't even know what it was until I found out a week later and I was like, yeah, I don't ever need to do that again. That wasn't fun. Yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> it wasn't fun at all. I mean, it doesn't take that much to not. Uh, make band camp miserable, <laughs> but heroin laced merit joints will do it. That uh, that's so wild that like that shit was happening. Like, oh yeah, we're just gonna toss some heroin into the fucking joint. Jesus. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand. I like. I look. I don't. I don't deal drugs. I never dealt drugs. I do know a little bit about business and commerce and killing your uh, customers. Not a good. Not a good business move. I never understood that. So, uh, this is relevant to something that just happened. I guess we'll. Briefly touch on it. I don't know. Yeah, we can talk about it. I'd like to leave names out because I don't know whose names have been released. Yeah, at this point, by time of era, probably everyone, but who Just knows? to be safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four comics, it looks like in LA, OD'd on fentanyl, least cocaine, or cocaine laced with fentanyl. Cocaine laced with fentanyl. Yeah. Uh, like last night. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. What th- three, three dead, dead one, one in an ICU? Yeah, I don't know where they're at at this point. Hopefully, making a full recovery. Yeah, yeah. Physically, I doubt mentally is going to happen quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine that being not have some long term effects on yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Went to this party and three of my friends died and I didn't. <sighs> That's yeah. oh, I didn't even think about that part. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, you're right, man. Uh, the, <sighs> oh, it's terrible. But they obviously all unknowingly consume the fentanyl. Yeah. And it, I was talking to a friend who is friends with some Coke dealers last night about it. And apparently, according to the rumor and hearsay is it has to do with the cartels basically being at war with America and they're just poisoning some of their supply. Are you serious? Fuck. Holy shit, man. I'm glad I got out of that. <laughs> oh man. Now you get the fucking cartel involved. Dude, I've done some tours in Mexico. You don't fuck with the cartel, dude. I remember the, the promoter who, when I first did a tour in Mexico, like right over the border too, where the cartel, he's like, yeah, they just, you know, I grew up in Jersey. He's like, he's like, yeah, it's like the mob, man. You just, you, you don't get involved. You don't have to worry about it. Although we did find a hand over there <laughs> and, and they burned out my, uh, a car in front of my, uh, in front of my chalet. I'm like, okay, get me out of here. <laughs> like, oh, good times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, here's your comedy. Murray. <laughs> right. Did you like that joke, sir? Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> Man, a cartel is, yeah, oh, that sucks, dude. I mean, you know, you go, and we talked a little bit about this on air, and I'm not, I am not a preacher. I'm not a lecturer. I've, I've made horrible choices in my life, and I've been very fortunate that they've turned out to be somewhat funny stories, and I survived, and I was lucky, and I think, I think going in 
to drug use, you know, going in that, yeah, this is going to be fun, but there's a risk. And I mean, you make that agreement. That's taking addiction off the table, but you know, for, and I, in front of, from what I know, and I only know one of the four, um, you know, I don't think they had addiction problems or anything. Yeah, I don't like think that. so. Either. I think it, you know, I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of stories about them being huge party, party animals. So I don't, I think it might, and that's the thing. It's a roll of the dice. Yeah. Well, and I have a feeling that's the reason that person probably survived is they probably took a lower dose. They were just kind of like, oh yeah, I'll do a bump or something. Yeah. This is pure speculation, but sure, sure. why they're still here. Yeah. Like people, you know, you're at a party and people are blasting down rails. Like, fine, I'll do a bump. Right. Right. Pure speculation. I don't yeah, know yeah. shit. Now I'm in, speaking going back to heroin, I did shows in, I think it was Fort Lauderdale. And the MC, I just, I know I'm playing with this. Is it not? No, no, no. I just thought you were just constantly trying to type. No, it's just, it's a fidget thing. It's a fidget thing. Um, For the video version. Yeah. If it's, if it's bumping on the mic, tell me I'll stop. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, There was a bad uh, batch of heroin going around Florida. And the MC like said, came up to me afterwards and like, can I buy your album? I'm like, no, dude, you're fucking, here, take it. He's like, well, can you sign it? My family, like his cousin was family was there that his cousin tried heroin for the first time and it was that bad batch that was going through florida and killed him instantly and it just i don't know man when you get when you get into that heavy stuff that that risk gets a little and again i'm not preaching i'm not preaching the only like the only, again the only reason i never got into heroin was my own reasons of again vanity and i don't want to die you know i don't want to run that risk but i ran my risk with coke i ran my risk with other stuff you know you, you just you go into that knowing it could go south 100 percent i i started looking into last night today and like getting fentanyl testing strips and getting like narcan to just leave in the apartment i don't do coke i have no interest in coke but right. uh, i've definitely had guests be like yeah i'm gonna do some poetry while we're doing the podcast <laughs> it's happened you know please don't arrest me but right, drug, right, sure. drugs have been consumed in this apartment surprise to no one again 20 years ago i could have consumed drugs in this apartment because i lived up the street <laughs> right <laughs> So I don't want to ever have to face like, oh, hey, someone came here to do a podcast, have a good time, whatever, and end up fucking dead or comatose in my apartment. Oh, dude, that's that's got to be, I can't say that's got to be the worst, but it's up there. <laughs> yeah. I, I I don't know what I would, I just don't want to face it. Like, hey, if you're going to do that, just test it real quick. Like, there are resources for free fentanyl testing kits out there. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I actually just posted one to my Instagram story about an hour ago. Yeah, well, it's timely. Yeah, well, it's... Purely in response to what happened. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it, it's funny, you know. I'm and I'm, I'm a pr- bit older than you, and I'm, I'm you know probably the old guard at the uh, of the comics in uh, Los Angeles. So, you know, I, I'll hear like the young con. I'll hear like you know like you know. I remember being told Coke made a huge comeback in the, on the comedy scene back you know a few years back, and then heroin was back for a, quite a while. Again, it might still be back. I don't know, but it, it's such a weird. Especially in the, you know, I don't want to say the arts because it'll sound like a douche and kick me in the neck, <laughs> but in the creative world of music and comedy and possibly acting, I don't, I don't know that world that much, but you know, there, the drug uses, the guys I looked up to in comedy and music all did drugs and, and came out with great art and great material. So, so there is, there is almost, there's more of an okay to do it in our line of work in, in the creative world than there is in like, let's say finance or, or anything like oh, that. Oh, I'm pretty sure Coke's pretty prevalent in oh, finance. Dude, <laughs> go to the eighties in New York. Like I was a, I was a kid uh, grew up outside in New York in the eighties when if you were black and you had a rock of crack, you were in prison, but the fucking wall street guys were buying, you know, eight balls and getting a slap on the wrist or probably sharing it with the cops to be honest with you. So yeah, there's a, yeah, it's definitely a rich person truck for sure. It's definitely come down. It's not quite a rich person drug anymore, but it's still, it's still out there quite a bit. And it's back to the the art entertainers, you know, using drugs. Do you think it's more like tortured people are using the drugs and they would it helps them create, or if it's just they would still create if like they were left sober, but still like you know those demons coming out through their art. I, I that's a big. Um that's a big discussion. I mean, I've talked to people who, you know, who, who, you know, especially the older, the older generation of comics who are now all recovering and, um, you know, because they were in the eighties when, you know, they were get literally getting paid in Coke, literally getting paid in Coke. And, you know, they're all in recovery now. And, 
And they were all afraid. Uh, you know, if I stop doing drugs, am I going to be funny? Am I, I mean, that even goes to therapy. I've talked to comics who've gotten in, who didn't want to, who got into therapy thinking they'd never be funny again. So I'm sure they're, I'm sure when somebody is, if they're using it as a crutch is definitely a worrisome. I don't know. I don't know if I could speak to, if it feels it, but there's definitely a common denominator at Bill Hicks's great bit about, you know, if you're anti-drugs, throw away all your albums, <laughs> <laughs> throw away all your albums, man, because everybody was fucking high as kites. It's true. It's, it's again, I'm again, I, I, I don't preach. I don't condone drugs. I don't uh, rail against them. I'll just tell my stories and make your own decision even if you care what i say honestly i feel like we should be decriminalizing them and then we wouldn't have situations like what happened that's if you can regulate them what we regulate alcohol pretty well yeah that's true we're regulating marijuana pretty well at the moment oh i don't know <laughs> i don't know i was never a big marijuana guy i never it never did well for me um i like I, especially now Oh my God. Cause I'd stop. Cause I smoked pot in high school and in the early nineties and stuff like that. And then I didn't smoke, touch it for a decade. And then after the chronic came out, like, like, I don't know what I smoke pot. I say this is my act is sorry. It's a joke, but it's true. If I smoke pot now, I laugh for 10 minutes and then I cry for an hour. It's it, it, uh, I, it can't handle it, but I found like, I also need, you know, I've been a comic for 20 years, but before that I was bartending and waiting table. So I didn't go to bed before 3 a.m. from like 93 to 2005, you know, and then that's when I got married and had a kid. And, and so when I had to get up and I had to go to sleep, I was trying pills. I was trying alcohol. I was trying everything, but fucking THC CBD combo, dude, I can chug a fucking triple espresso, eat one of those and sleep for eight hours after. So I'm a big fan of the THC CBD combo, but every once in a while, <laughs> I'll eat one of those. And before I fall asleep, I'm like, I need to call somebody right now. I am way too fucking high. <laughs> oh, I, I get that. I'm when I was regularly using THC it was back when like strains, the, you got a you got a dime that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I I'm right there with you. Like now it's just like, uh, this thing has flavors and <laughs> I, I don't know. Just give me that. And yeah, I'm much like you, any THC and I just don't, and you know, now that I think about it, now I'm going to sound like the old guy here. Maybe, maybe the marijuana didn't get more powerful. Maybe it was just not as shitty as the crap I used to have to smoke that I bought out of the back of the ice cream truck in town. That was all stems and seeds and poss possibly oregano at that point. It just gave me a headache more than it did give me high. Uh, I, I think it's, it's definitely improved. They got fucking botanists working on it. I know. Right? I know. It's crazy. It's great. I have, I won't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say who it is, but, uh, a husband left a huge law firm, a huge Beverly Hills law firm and started his own dispensary and is making 10 times more than you do realize you're on camera when you do. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Murray did a, a quick silent off mic. And... <laughs> well, camera. I, don't, I, <laughs> I, I don't know why I felt bad about saying who it was because she told me and it's not a secret. So who cares? <laughs> And if since I'm on camera, I didn't realize I'm putting on my denim jacket because I just came from the beach and I'm dressed horribly. So again, that vanity goes in. So I've got my denim jacket. So I figure uh, I'll just sweat instead of look like the old queen I'm dressed up like right now. All of a sudden, uh, on the way out the door, my cameras are going to fail. Murray's just going to push him over. Oh, no. oh, did I trip over that? Sorry. It looks like it's an audio version. Aw. Aw. So what else is happening in this neighborhood now? I'm trying to remember where we used to go. The Thai place burned up there. I, I don't speak of the movie swingers. That's when I lived here was when swinger, it was like, it was based all up here. Oh, I know. I was, and I lived right up here during that kind of the heyday of before the, the 101 was remodeled. Yeah. 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 The, the, the resurgence of swing dancing, which I can proudly say I never got into. Actually, um, my client who we were talking about her podcast before we got on air uh -huh. actually was in that movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. She had a small part. She was, uh, the Dorothy. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like when I started, first started working with her, I'm like, I was asking her movie questions about the production. Oh yeah, like that like the the scene where they meet her and the waitress mm -hmm. after after hours was shot at three of clubs over on. Oh, on, was shot at three yeah. clubs? I assumed it was at the old tiki bar on Sunset. You remember that little tiki lounge? Yeah, that's where I thought it was. No, oh okay. They set dressed the three of clubs. Oh, that's cool. Is three of clubs still around? I believe so. The signs are still there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I talk like I lived here in like the eight, 1920s. Like, <laughs> but Hollywood's taken a huge change over the last 20 years. Oh, man. yeah. It's taken a huge change. 
a lot less rock and roll. That's the bummer part, man. That's the bummer part. I used to love going to like, uh, oh, what are they called? Like space. Uh, what the frick? Blanket on the name of the club. The spa, uh, Space Lounge, I think it was called, and catching all these great local LA bands. I, I miss that a lot. Knowing all the doormen from the, when I was doormanning at the comedy store, <laughs> you know, getting in for free. That was great. The, the uh, House of Blues used to be across the street from a comedy store. I know. That was such a goddamn shame when that got torn <sighs> down. Fuck, dude. And so we, when I started out as a doorman at the comedy store, and there was, it was just favors from doormen from, um, and sorry for local, non-local people, uh, from the comedy store down to where the old Tower Records used to be. You had, you know, hey, I'm at a door at the store. They'll let you in. And then when they come up, hey, I'm uh, the doorman at the House of Blues. You let them in. So I got to see concerts at the House of Blues. Like I'd get off set. I'd, I'd do a set or get off work at the doorman. I'd see who's playing. And I'd walk over. I got Johnny Cash. They might be giants. It, it was so great, man. It was so great. Now it's another soulless fucking hotel. Oh, dude, I went. I started doing sets at the store again over the last month when they opened up, and just I'm just it's yeah, it just changed. It used to be so rock and roll, and now it's all Euro trash. Can you say that Euro trash? And it's all Kardashians, really. I mean, it really is all. Well, it, it's crazy. Like the Andaz, which was the Riot House fucking Hyatt. Yeah, yeah. Calls its fucking bar in the lobby the Riot House. Like, oh, that it, it's it's painful. Yeah, I know. I know. There's so many rock and roll stories out of that hotel. I'm like, the walls are still paper thin, and they will fucking kick you out if you make noise. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I I may get myself fired from this, but I occasionally work security there. So. Oh, well, maybe we should change the subject. Oh, whatever. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I occasionally do, and if they throw me out for it, whatever. Yeah, man. That is legendary. This Jesus, the stuff Zeppelin did in there alone. Oh, my God. It's like a wax museum of it now. Like, you go inside and like, one of the walls is painted like the strip in like probably 79, somewhere between 79 and 81. It's got like an Eddie money billboard and fucking a share billboard in there. It's like, <laughs> but this is a $300 a night hotel. It's insane. The bar is called the riot house. Like, yeah, I know Ugh, it's such a drag. There was a legendary, well, not a legendary kind there's a legendary story about a comedian who killed himself jumping off the riot house, a comedy store comic. And this was back in the late seventies, early eighties, and you know, obviously had his issues, and he killed himself jumping off the riot house to land on the roof of the comedy store, but he missed and hit the parking lot. Yeah, you would really have to get some lift to make that's that. That's, that's a, maybe uh, aeronautics wasn't his yeah. <laughs> wasn't his specialty, but that's a that's two driveways in a parking lot to get the distance. I guess if you if it's high enough, you can. You did really have to make a run. Just, do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> just fucking. And he was probably not sober doing probably that. Probably not. Probably not. I wonder if he like figured it all out and said, "He's like, okay, I, if I go this fast, I'll clear it," and then just tripped. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, do you ever see that uh, documentary on? Um, oh, fuck what? Um, I'm blanking on the name right now. See, this is what happens when you stop drinking. Can't remember anything. I mean, the bottle's right in front of you. <laughs> it smells great. Um, you can have a little taste. It's not drinking <laughs> if you just taste it. Who was it? Mad Magazine? No, no, it wasn't Mad. Who was the the other? Cracked? No. Oh fuck! It's basically who who Lorne Michaels stole all the cast members from to start Saturday Night Live. Second City? No. Or, oh, God damn it! Because there was SCTV that was a lot of. Yeah, no, that was Canadian. This was this was actually New York. This is where Belushi and all those guys got started. They did Animal House. They it's the National same Lampoon's. guy. National Lampoon. Thank you. God, I'm an idiot. <laughs> they did Van Wilder too. <laughs> like National Lampoon technically did Burt Kreischer's story for. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so there's a great documentary on National Lampoon and the guy who started it. And if I can't remember National Lampoon, I'm not gonna remember this guy's fucking name. But uh, <laughs> but he killed himself. He uh, he played a uh, stork in Animal House. What the fuck? What the hell are we supposed to do? You moron! That guy. He wrote Animal House. He wrote all those early stuff. I think he co-wrote Caddyshack and. Stuff like that. And he went to Hawaii and he killed himself. But Harold Ramis said, if I know him as well as I do, he tripped and fell looking for a place to jump. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get super dark, but no, we're talking about suicide. Right, oh, right. Oh, dose, oh, overdosing. Well, how much darker can we get? I mean, we probably could, but <laughs> <laughs> like how much thought do you put into like picking your place to commit suicide? Like to go all the way to Hawaii to do it. Well, I mean, who knows? Maybe he caught some waves. Maybe saw a whale. I don't know. Maybe you always wanted to go to a luau. Who knows? You know? Like, this pig roast wasn't quite up to snuff. It's over. <laughs> I'm done. It's nice to have money where you can pick where you want to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, make it majestic. I don't know. So some Greyhound station in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Or the bathroom. I feel like doing it in the bathroom is courteous. It's an easy cleanup. Oh, good point. Well, it depends on how you're going out. Any, there's tile there. It's not like you're fucking ruining carpet. Oh, that's true. That's Unless it's one of those weird houses with carpeted bathrooms. Like, I know that's a thing. Still? I think my grandmother had it when I was a kid. I was in a celebrity's house fairly recently. Name drop, name drop. I'm Who not is it? Come on, do it. Do what I did and show it over camera. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anyone who is, listens to the show on a regular basis could probably figure out who it was. Okay, all right, fine. You can tell me off air. Uh, he recently just bought a house that in Vegas that was like a very nice house in the 70s and mm-hmm. like floor-to-ceiling mirrors and carpeted bathroom in the downstairs bathroom. It's like, what the fuck? Right. I I don't know if he's going to keep it, but I don't. as far as I know, he's not changing it. Ugh. I remember for a while in the 70s when I was a kid, they had uh, car, like, carpet covers for the toilet i remember those dude how much did those stink right oh that sounds terrible yeah like why why would you do that i don't i don't know i don't know 70s was a weird time it was i I wasn't alive yet but i was a i was a mere tyke i was a mere tyke i only remember uh carpeted covered toilets really that's all i really remember that that made it into the 80s a little bit okay i do remember it in my childhood but it's so funny if you do go back and look at those movies from that like took place in like 82, they look like they could have been 77. You know, there's not it wasn't like the 80s hit and then all of a sudden everybody's wearing acid wash and neon and stuff like that. There's definitely a bleed over of feathered hair and and bell bottoms and, and disco and, and disco and who's trucking t-shirts and stuff like that. Well, and there was the same bleed from 99 to the early 2000s too. <sighs> big oh. ass Jinko jeans. And- oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess the real big like real turn in fashion was the eighties into the nineties with the onset of grunge and the death of hair metal. That, that was probably the most drastic change in fashion. I think 100%. Yeah, like, Oh yeah. Wearing a flannel is cool. I, I remember like being in middle school, having a flannel tied around my waist. Like. <laughs> I love like, like there was a great uh, documentary on that called hype. You're going to have to Google that. Cause there are 10,000 documentaries called hype about the Seattle scene and listening to like Tad or, or one of those guys from the going like all of a sudden Macy's is selling flannels for like 125 bucks. We were buying them at Sears and wearing them because we were cold. Like that's the only reason we wore them. We weren't fucking making fashion. It's so funny. Oh, uh, I remember buying mine at like secondhand shops. Cause that was the real way to buy them. Oh yeah. Yeah. But also at the same time, Macy's was selling back in black t-shirts for, 125 and that was always depressing to see like an acdc shirt in macy's for 100 but i mean what do you think about the trend of like people wearing full-on metal shirts now yeah with, like streetwear yeah you know it's fine you know, i'm a i'm a i'm a rock and roller myself I, I like i like the rock and roll um but yeah seeing these kids are like, these kids are gonna fucking shoot me now <laughs> <laughs> They all have guns. I know, I know, I know. They will actually shoot me when I make fun of them for not knowing who the MC5 is and they're wearing it on their shirt. (laughs) Or I remember I I called this chick out on a, uh, I call her chick, she's a friend of mine. Uh, She's a comic. Uh, She was wearing a Ramones shirt. I'm like, I'll give you five bucks if you can name me three Ramones songs. And she said, don't do this to me. (laughs) And just walked away. There's a fucking meme about that, about dudes challenging chicks wearing shirts. Like, just let us wear our shirts in peace. (laughs) I mean, it's a good design. The the Ramones design is a good design. It's been hacked several. I'm a, I'm on a podcast with my name on that design too. So I can't, I can't really judge them that much. It's that design and the fucking, um, joy division fucking oh yeah 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 that's used so much yeah yeah the joy division thing and uh yeah i think that that's probably the big two right yeah well rush brush had that they they had a couple too i think that were hacked pretty hard and um uh, probably pink floyd's like the the wall the the wall yeah or the or the prism the prism yeah 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 those are very hackable i think i don't know how i don't know how you get away with the licensing of the like the urban outfitters and stuff like that because they're not you know they're not i don't they can't be sanctioned. Like, I, don't, I don't even know if that's the right word. They can't be licensed, all these. I mean, they very well could be. Maybe. I mean, I bought a delicious vinyl uh, uh, old hip-hop label from Urban Outfitters one time. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way this could be. But maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe Rick Rubin. I think it was Rick Rubin who started Delicious Vinyl. Don't hold me to that. Rick Rubin's just like, yeah, I'll take the payday. I know. Rick, Rick Rubin's like, yeah. Again, if he loses $50,000, it's, it's, he's never going to see it. He's not, like, I mean, what? I don't even know what that is. I'm sorry. That's, I was, that's some line item somewhere. I know. I was wiping my butt with a $50,000 bill. <laughs> no big deal. 
I don't know if they have fifteen thousand dollar bills. They don't. Okay. We can tell that Murray's doing well in entertainment, but not that well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've still only wiped my butt with twenty thousand dollar bills. <laughs> Fair. Fair. <laughs> But I, I've seen people like in full on like actual Iron Maiden shirts too. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, and you know, what's your fair Maiden album? Oh, I don't, I don't listen to them. Like, <laughs> not even like, no shame about it. like. Yeah, I don't listen. to them. The shirts is cool. Like Eddie's just cool. Yeah, at least they know who Eddie is. I don't. I'm paraphrasing. Sure, but sure. The, but I mean, let's be honest. I mean that I'm, I'm not an. I, I I went. I I wrongly hated metal when I was in high school. I I fully admit I wrongly hated it. So uh, I I like metal now. But well, like, but, but I'm looking at your Exodus shirt. Like that. That's a really cool shirt. So maybe you want to wear the design. Those Eddie shirts were awesome. You know. Well, and this is part of the reason that like when I go to shows and buy shirts, I make sure to buy a shirt with tour, with tour dates on it. Oh, that's oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, no. I was there, motherfucker. Yeah, that's right. I was fucking there. <laughs> that's a good point. I grew up in a very born again religious household. So when I snuck off to concerts, I couldn't buy shirts because I couldn't have evidence that I went to these shows. So I, I missed out on, you know, I, I talked to my friends who have their ticket stubs and their old, sh- their original concerts, their original Motley Crue shirts from like 85 and stuff like that. I'm like, I, I only got the memories and they're fading. <laughs> yeah. I have tour shirts from the 90s still. Yeah. Yeah. I barely fit in. Yeah, that are just so full of fucking holes at this point. <laughs> I'm bummed. I used to keep. I, I was really into the Grateful Dead for a long time, and I'm sorry. I know. I figured that was coming. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they used to do really cool tickets. Like they designed their own tickets, and you didn't go through Ticketmaster for the Grateful Dead back in. I don't. I don't know. I haven't got. I stopped seeing the Dead in like the mid '90s, so I don't know. Right before Jerry died, I stopped seeing them. Um, but you didn't have to go through Ticketmaster. I mean, if you have, you had to, and this is this isn't a remember when. This is a cool thing. I thought was uh, I was grew up in Jersey. You had to get an index card. You had to write Palo Alto, California, uh, and you had to write uh, Murray Valeriano, uh, four tickets, Brendan Byrne Arena, uh, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, four tickets. And then if you got then the, and then you're like okay, Murray Valeriano, uh, New Jersey. Uh, four tickets, Madison Square Garden. You had to write another one. Uh, Murray Valeriano, four tickets, uh, Foxborough uh, Stadium, Boston. Uh, and then you mailed it to Palo Alto. And then four months later, you got an envelope and you're like, okay, I got, didn't get Madison Square Garden. Okay, great. I got Brandon Burn. I got Foxborough. Oh, I didn't get, get Deer Creek. And it, 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 But that was really cool. And then they designed their own tickets. So they had these really cool, every ticket, every tour was different. And they had like raised uh, art on it, like drawings of, of the, the skeletons and the dancing bears and stuff. And they're really, really cool. It's a shame that had to go away. That is a goddamn shame. That's a shame. Fucking cool little tour posters fucking going away is mm-hmm. a goddamn shame. Like that was part of like what would bring me to some shows like, oh, that's a cool poster. I'll check that band out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or and especially if it was just that, that just to that tour. You know, and and you could have that, and that would, and you and you didn't have the uh, other ones from the or other. hell, even specific dates like, oh, it's this lineup at the Aragon Ballroom, of Chicago. Yeah, yeah, like fuck yeah, yeah. There's nothing better than like seeing a band open, and then five years later they're headlining the bowl or something. You know, that happened to me with the Arcade Fire. I went and I saw David Byrne, uh, the old Talking Heads guy, at the and the Arcade Fire open, and uh, David Byrne classic amazing artist on the punk scene in new york um, oh, mutual respect for him and the talking heads had a rough time following arcade fire <laughs> did not do well for the first half of his set because they came in and fucking blew the doors off the, and they to his defense a year later they're headlining the bowl but um, yeah but it's cool to see these really these new bands come in and just in an opening set and then fucking take off a couple of years later oh i know it is one of the most magical things it's just like Oh, hey. Or catching someone at like some festival for like 15 minutes when they're playing like the side stage and like a year or two later, like, oh, wow, they're they're headlining now. Yeah, yeah. Or unless your buddy takes mushrooms and ruins the whole day for you. Yeah, I take it back. He didn't ruin the whole day. You know what happened? I ended up, I went and got, because I wanted to see, he wanted to see the Foo Fighters. I wanted to see Oasis and they were headlining. And I f- finally like came down and I was... And this is the end of a day in a fucking desert in 120. And I've just had a bad trip on mushrooms. I finally come down. Fucking Oasis goes on stage at like 11 and didn't play a note. And he, uh, not Noel, the other brother, I'm blanking on his name too. Gallagher just stands there cross-armed, staring at the, just being his obnoxious Oasis self for 15 minutes. And I turned to my girlfriend at the time. <laughs>
And I, I just said, you know what? Fuck this guy. Let's go home. <laughs> I didn't even send him to see him. I just turned around. I'm like, I had a fucking day. I don't need your rock star bullshit right now. I'm getting the fuck out of here. And I turned around and left. <laughs> oh, that's, that's magical and kind of a shame at the same time. Yeah. You, Oasis. Now well, let's talk about me. I'd rather talk about music than drugs anyway, but, uh, Oasis needed to be there, you know, because back in, again in the '90s when they came out, you, you had the you know Wonderwall was a huge Wonderwall was a huge hit, and you had you had that anti the Eddie Vedder, uh, Kurt Cobain anti rock star. Uh, we don't want to be famous. We just want to blah blah blah. We want to be artists. We want to be artists. So you needed an Oasis to come in and get kicked out of Switzerland, like not be allowed to play in Switzerland because they started such a fucking riot and destroyed a hotel. Like you need that rock star stuff. You need that's that's the stuff I like. That's the stuff that I used to. I used to do. Which unfortunately very sad right now. I don't know why we keep going back to overdosing, but I have a, a joke on my last album about Scott Weiland from uh sdp sdp who died but he was alive when i did the joke and it was a joke about him dying and now he's dead i'm like oh that was a little did you kill scott I, yes oh no oh no somebody check on liam gallagher <laughs> <laughs> murray's just assassinating people with heroin <laughs> oh no god damn it we're back on overdose i know i know well man, i mean look it's it sucks and it's sad but it it you know, it's a, a, a friend of ours. You know what I mean? It's, it's somebody we know. And, and, and again, we're not preaching and we're not condoning, but we've also both have dabbled in that in our day. Some still, I'm not pointing the fingers slayer. Uh, there's only two people here. There's only two people here. There's no casting crew. There's no crew operating these cameras. It's a one man show. If you're talking about something, it's obviously me. You don't have to beat around the bush. So, you know, so it's, 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 it's on our minds and, and you know, so it, it obviously it's going to be, you know, and I, I th think we heard before we started recording that the, the one who survived is, is on the upswing. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope that they make a full recovery. Yeah. That'd be great. Obviously it's again, um, you know, nobody wants to see anybody die, but, but you know, you know, also I don't, I don't, I don't condemn them for making their choices either. That was, that was their choice and they knew they're mature. They're old. They know old enough. I should say they know what they're getting into. And I, you know, we're, we're both the same thing. I always said, I'm a never say never guy. Um, when I stopped doing those heavy drugs years ago, uh, and, and then I wasn't, you know, strung out or anything. I was still recreational. Um, I said, you know, maybe. I'm just going to stop now because I'm very lucky. Again, I say I don't have an addictive personality. I, who knows? I might be in denial, but like I stopped doing Coke because I hated watching the sun come up. I really hated it. I really, and then I ended up getting a serious girlfriend at the time and I would like, she'd get up and go to work and I'd still be like, where are you going? <laughs> you know? So I, so that's why I stopped, stopped doing, I stopped taking Vicodin because I, I, I couldn't poop. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got tired of being constipated, you know? So I was very, I quit smoking cigarettes. I just threw them out the window one day. I'm like, I'm done. And that was it. And I, and I didn't touch them again. So I don't have an addictive personality. So I think that's very fortunate. But, um, so yeah, so, but I've always been a never say never. So like when I stopped doing it, I was like, who knows? Maybe one day down the road at, um, after a Friday night show, the opener's got a couple lines. I don't have anything to do on Saturday. I don't have to be back at the club till eight o'clock. There's no radio. Maybe one day. You know, that'll happen. And then I had my heart condition and I'm like, no, I'm not gonna no, <laughs> kill you dead. Cause I would be, cause if I did that that weekend, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. Cause I got diagnosed with this heart thing on the road. Yeah. yeah I heard you talking about it on a podcast. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, probably. I've, dude, trust me when somebody almost dies and they come back to life, they'll talk about it all the fucking time. <laughs> like try to get me to, <laughs> by the way, I'm surprised I haven't showed you my scar yet. Like that's like I had Andrew, you had Andrew Rose on your show. Yeah. We were talking about this earlier. Andrew Rose, a comic who had open heart surgery when he was like, Ten or something like yeah, that. Yeah, real right? young. Yeah. And uh I'd never met him before and he was opening on this little run I did. And I was already I'd already gone through my heart thing and I was talking about it on stage. And the first night he's up there and he's and I've made it clear. Like I, I documented because I had a podcast I had the Road Stories podcast for like eleven years. Uh I retired it before the pandemic. And so they my listeners followed that journey. It started from an annoying cough <laughs> on the on the podcast to oh, I'm dying. So they kind of followed that journey. So I had no problem talking about it. And then, so people knew what had happened to me. And then I'm watching this kid on stage talking about open heart surgery. I'm like, this motherfucker ripping me off. <laughs> like, 
dude, know who you're stealing from, dude. That's my stuff, dude. And like, I'm, of course, I'm holding it like I'm the only person this ever happened to, you know, because it was really a random thing that the happened doctors to me. were doing experimental surgery. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've never done it before. Well, I can't believe the balls on this motherfucker. <laughs> and then he comes off stage and he like shows me where his pacemaker and his scar. I'm like, oh, all right, you're legit. No. He's a heart surgery hipster. He, he you know, he's old school. Yeah. <laughs> You're the poser. You did it late. I true, absolutely. I waited. I waited till I was in my forties. He did it when he was fifteen. <laughs> right? You poser. I know, right? I know. But he did it when it was cool. Yeah, I guess. I guess his is a genetic, if I remember correctly. I don't want to tell his story. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it's. Genetic, <clears throat> I often encourage Andrew not to breed. Yeah, totally, and probably not do coke. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he's an adult. He's that's true. Again, breeding breeding affects someone else. Coke, does, well, I mean, Coke does, but in yeah, a different it, way. Yeah, I would imagine. I would imagine. Mine was a uh, an an anomaly. Mine was just a valve that just fucking stopped working for no reason. Like I had no heart condition. I had no clogged valves. Extremely healthy at the time. Just a valve just stopped working, and then all of a sudden I'm on my deathbed. Crazy. I'm the walking uh, the walking definition of shit just happens. But you're still here. On I am. Part. I'm here. I'm here, and I'm and I'm and I'm loving life back in Hollywood, remembering all these great stories from living in this neighborhood, man. Bottle of whiskey, just staring at. Oh, you. it looks good too. It looks good. It looks good. I'm just being a horrible enabler. No, please don't. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. About it. It's funny too. Like I never, you know, I didn't. I didn't think it was going to last two years. I honestly, I think like you, like everybody, this pandemic was going to last two weeks. I really thought I could chill for two weeks. If we weren't fucking children here in America, it would have. <laughs> but we are fucking petulant children, and we got to get our haircuts and keep throwing fucking house parties. And uh, well, and I, I don't get political on a public uh, thing much, but I understood the frustration and the anger. But it was all pointed at the wrong people. It was all po- like everybody showing up on the steps. That no man. It's not your local government. It's our government fucking threw us under the bus. They threw us under the fucking bus. And I don't care if you come out of this. This is the only thing I'll say political. If you come out of this thing thinking that either side gives a shit about you, you have your head up your ass. That's the only thing I'll say. Oh, 100%. Uh, there's a whole tirade I can go on about the fucking recall about that sort of oh, shit. Oh, yeah, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm not going to because right. we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're not going to fucking do that. No one wants my political opinion. Right. Like, uh, again, and it's my opinion. It's my uneducated opinion. I'm not a politico at all. Oh, I'm mildly uneducated on pretty much everything I talk about on this show. So that's <laughs> part for the course. Like, unless it's booze or possibly cigars, I don't really know what I'm talking right, about. Right, right. Oh, man, I haven't had a good cigar in a long time. Oh, I was smoking a stick before you came yeah. up. Yeah, I haven't smoked cigars. I used to really like cigars. We used to, uh, can you get, um, can you get the good cigars now? Are they? Are you still banned from uh, Cuba? Can you get them? Or are they legal? Obama made it so you could bring fifty Cubans back into the country legally. Of course he did. He was a smoker. <laughs> <laughs> Trump repealed a lot of that shit, so I don't know. Oh, really? He did? Oh, that's interesting. well. Yeah, like twenty seventeen, I was on one of the first direct flights from the U.S. to Cuba. Okay, and I sure as fuck brought fifty. Yeah, back absolutely, absolutely. I burned through them all. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Oh, I didn't know you repealed that. Because I, I remember when I remember I remember when we could finally, you know, finally shop in Cuba, like we all wanted to do. <laughs> oh, when I, when I first got to town, and I'm pointing at my old apartment, you can't see. <laughs> I was working at NBC, and I was writing radio promos for the sitcoms at the time. And this, I, I won't say his name, but he's a big voice actor. It still is, like all cartoons, all you know, legendary in the voice world. It was like, hey man, you like Cuban cigars? You go to this place on Ventura. You tell him Matt. <laughs> well, he says, tell him Matt sent you, and he'll hook you up. And so I went, and I, I look at him, like, they're like, what kind of cigars are you into? And I'm like, oh, I'm just I'm thinking I'm looking around. I don't know what um, Matt said you might be able to. He's like, oh, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go in the back, downstairs, under, you know, like into the closet, and he had a he had his own humidor in there for the Cuban ones. I'm like, am I buying drugs here? What are, these are just cigars, right? Uh, that is uh, shit like that is why I love LA because <laughs> that is such LA shit. Like, right. oh, you said the code word. Yeah, right? yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. This place is a horrible place to visit. Yeah. It's an amazing place to live. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because it's all about knowing some insider, some cool thing, some bar that has no sign. Oh uh, yeah, some band is warming up for their summer tour. I can't tell. I saw I saw the Black Crows at the Viper Room. I've, you know, REM dropping into these little bars, and it's so fantastic. It's such a great place to live, man. 
yeah. let Fox News shit all over it and nobody come visit, I'm fine. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm fine all about that. like that mass exodus to Austin. I'm like, cool. Yeah. Going. Dude, seriously, go. Go. <laughs> go. There's going to be more waves for me in the ocean and more stage time. And hopefully rent will go down a little bit. Yeah, that's true too. Did the rent come down during the pandemic or? Uh, yes, because I'm willing to negotiate. Oh, okay. All right. I I 100% negotiated with my manager. I'm like, hey, it's middle pandemic. I've been paying my rent on time. I would like a cut on my rent. Oh, there you go. There you go. Is this a mom? Is this a a, man, a corporate? Owned oh, it's or a, a mom, corporate. Mom? Owned. Okay. Okay. I don't give a fuck. I'll right I'll negotiate. Oh no, no, that's smart. No, that's smart. Because what's the worst they're going to tell me? No. Yeah. Yeah. There's only another thousand apartments within. You can swing a dead cat and hit one around here. Well, and I've I've been at war for the last year with my downstairs neighbors. Oh, really? Because he's a fucking hip hop producer. Oh, and felt really? the need to like. He put air quotes in that. By the way, I don't know if uh, anyway. He felt the need to rattle my floors at points. So. Oh. But can't you put air quotes around just about everybody in this town, though? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, Matt, you're a podcaster? I'm a podcaster. Well, you are a podcaster, but I'm like countless times I've heard like, oh, you're a comedian? You know what? My dentist is a comedian. No, your dentist is a dentist. <laughs> your, your dentist you, is an open micer at best. And maybe if he even does that anymore, you know. I remember when I first got married and, and my wife and I, I, I was not doing stand up at the time. I got really fried out and I was writing for TV, so I stopped doing stand up and then I started doing stand up again. It was like, if, like I just, it was like I had to tell my wife, like I was like, we need to talk. <laughs> like I, I want to get back into stand up and things are radically going to change. And uh, and she was like, and then after she saw how much work and and everything went into it and. Somebody, we were out at dinner and somebody said, oh, that exact same thing. Oh, really? You're a stand-up? My, my mailman, I think it says a stand-up. And my wife was like, how fucking insulting is that? <laughs> like, I'm like, really? I thought it was just me. She's like, no, that's super insulting. And my wife is pretty established in her field and, and all that. She's like, if somebody were to come up to me and say that to me, I would be so offended. So there's all, I'm saying there's a lot of air quotes. I'm not saying comedy is the end all or whatever, but everybody can call themselves whatever they want in this town. Oh yeah. Oh, and you can put it on the internet and make it true. Yeah. Yeah. Producers, actors, directors, podcasters, stand up, you know, well, at least with this, there's no barrier of entry. So you can actually fucking do it. Yeah. There are, unfortunately there are a lot of podcasters. Yeah. Uh, I was just in a, talking about this. Uh, there was something like 2.5 million podcasts on iTunes. Okay. Only 200,000 that are, have put out an episode in the last six months, but <laughs> 2.5 million podcasts. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And you know, it's so funny. Like I got into, I got into podcasting early on. Um, I just, I, I, I was trying to pitch a show. I was trying to, my podcast is called road stories. You can still catch it. On, I don't do it anymore. I retired it. Um, but if you like comedy, it's got every great comic from the last 20 years on it. You should check it out. Um, but when I started, it was still, you know, when I started, I had, Cause there were no other podcasts. I'd, I'd listened to Jimmy Pardo's never not funny. And I was like, Oh, I, this show, nobody wants to show. I should do this as a podcast. And I, and I got a ton, cause I had early, you know, I had Chris Hardwick on before he had his podcast and all those guys and Doug Benson and all those guys. And, uh, I had instant, like instant downloads. I'm like, Oh, this is fantastic. Cut to 15 years later. I started a YouTube show last year. Can't get anybody to fucking watch it. Like it's so saturated now. It's incredible. It's incredible. It absolutely is. Hell, I've been at this almost six years, which makes me still pretty early in the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, uh, I'm a middling podcaster at best. Like, yeah. I have a lot of great people on, but it's just like, oh, I'm that one percent is really just fucking what whole nother level. Well, here here's the other thing that killed pod and I'm still a big advocate for podcasting. I I loved I love the gorilla aspect of podcasting. I love the LA Cup Pod Fest Festival. My fucking favorite festival I've ever been. I, I know. I, I'm so bummed that it's not a thing anymore. I, I was talking to Dave Anthony. I, uh, Dave Anthony has picked up surfing. So I, I surf with him uh, like once a week or once every couple of weeks. And uh, and he and I'm like, man, I miss that. And he goes, yeah, I miss it too. And he, he was one of the creators and it just it just didn't. I don't, I can't, I don't know why it went under. Well, I, I have theories. I have theories too, but they're my friends. So I don't want to. Fair enough. I, I don't uh, want to speak of them. But it was great. And I love that gorilla aspect of podcasting. I was actually against advertisers and monetizing of it in the beginning because I'd come from TV and I, you know, I was tired of answering to executives and, and executives again, <laughs> you know, let's air quote those guys. They're they all lawyers who got sick of d being a lawyer and they got into TV and all of a sudden they're telling, you know, comics how to write funny, you know? So I got sick of having to answer to somebody. So I didn't want to monetize my podcast in the beginning. I didn't want advertisers. I didn't, I turned down networks in the beginning. I, I ended up going with all things comedy, Bill Burr's uh, podcast uh, network because they're like, 
we're just about the comedy. You can advertise with us if you want. You can advertise if you don't want. We're just here about, you know, all, all the ships, the rising tide rises all ships. And so I went with that network and they never forced me. They would call and say, Hey, Tom Segura has got uh, this mattress company. Here's such and such amount of money. If you want to do an ad on your podcast, if you don't no big deal, you know, it kind of grew from there. That's awesome. Like, and that's what makes this medium amazing is the fact that like you can do whatever the fuck you want. The gorilla aspect of it. I, yeah. Yeah. I love it. I fucking love it. No, me too. Now the, the shitty part is, uh, when fucking, and you know, I'm, I'm going to shit on Conan for this. Cause I got nothing against Conan when he started doing a podcast and Dak Shepard and his fucking wife start doing a con- uh, podcast and Steve Colbert starts doing a podcast and like, dude, you're killing a lot of shows. You're killing a lot of, a lot of comics who aren't getting their time. You have your own TV show, dude. You don't need a podcast. They're only killing quitters. I like the attitude, sir. I like the attitude. They're only killing quitters. If you're not in this for the love of the game, don't be in fucking podcasting. Oh, dude. A hundred percent for when everybody, I, I, I did, I spoke on a couple of podcast panels at like comic con and stuff like that. And the number one question is what advice would you give a up and coming podcast And it's always two. uh, don't put yourself under the comedy category. <laughs> My friend, Paul Gilmartin calls that, uh, Oh, what does he call that category? Pissing in the wind category or something well, like that. <laughs> I am so happy that like Apple rolled out subcategories. Cause like, yeah, I was pissing in the wind in comedy forever. Uh-huh. And then when I moved over to comedy interviews, I like up. T- oh, nice. Nice. So they're now they're subcategory. Yeah. Subcategorized. All right. And the other one I, I would say is, uh, base it off something you love because that, Exactly. Have another drink because that is because in the beginning, unless you're a name, nobody's going to hear it. Even if you are a fucking name. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Like not to name drop, but I worked on two shorts podcasts for a while uh-huh. and <coughs> his management team would come back to me and be like, why the fuck aren't we doing numbers? Mm-hmm. I'm like no fucking idea why you're not. I'm not marketing. I'm just, the right. editor. yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the editor. I'm the guy uploading it, but I have no fucking idea why you're not doing numbers, but it's fucking too short. Yeah, yeah. No. And you, you, you got to love what you're doing. Like, this is a perfect... Po- I listen to your podcast. You, you, you talk to comedians, musicians, adult actresses. You drink. I mean, that's your world, man. That's... You can... You would be doing this if the microphones weren't on, I'm sure. I mean, there's very, very, very often where the microphones go off and I'm like, we still hang for like another oh, hour. Oh, absolutely. Two. Absolutely. And that's what I did. That's what I did. But my Road Stories podcast, I just took the conversations at the bar I was having at the improv. And I just put a mic on it and we just told the, and the funny thing is like, I, like I'd have young comics come out. I want to be on your show. And I'm like, yeah, but I want the guy who grew up in the eighties. Cause he's got the fucking stories. He's right. got the, he's got the gunpoint at the, uh, you know, behind the chuckle hut. Cause the guy didn't want to pay him because he bombed. Those are the stories. I don't want to hear about you smoking pot and doing a, a show for your friend. That's not a real story. Like, yeah. I like those. Oh, I stories. didn't get enough Instagram engagement today. And- yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, Oh, I want to go. I want to be on. It's called road stories. Have you got on the road? No, I did a show in uh, Valencia. I'm like, eh, well, did you get shot? And it's not a story. I don't want to hear it. But Oxnard, man, I, I, was in the Ox, I was in Oxnard. And then it got to, podcasting got to, uh, uh, um, like, when Mark hit, when Mark Marin hit, and deservedly so, um, it became it became a, a club again. You know what I mean? The podcasting became a club. And then all of a sudden, Mark went from, you know, interviewing comics you might not have heard of to Barack Obama, <laughs> you know, right. so, so when now it's, so then it turned into a club again, but I prided myself on my show of a having women all the time and B, uh, comics you never heard of. I'm like, if you're funny and you got stories, you're welcome to do my show. I don't care if you have four Twitter followers. I don't care if you've never done a set on, on late night. If you're, if you got the chops and you got the stories fucking come on and I would get emails and tech, oh my god i've never heard of so and so this person's hilarious i bought their cd and and so i use that as a platform to hopefully get some other comics out there and get them so you didn't have to listen to mark Marin and listen to him talk to chris rock which by the way i would listen to mark Marin talk to chris rock any day i would do and for better or for worse for people who criticize rogan or not rogan has pretty much become the new johnny carson we're launching people's careers yes and no and i'm not i don't i don't Rogan bumped me at the comedy store in like 99 and I'm still mad at him. That's the, <laughs> that's the only thing, by the way, rightfully so <laughs> I maybe had five minutes and four of them were funny. Like rightfully so he bumped me in 99. That's the only opinion I have on Joe Rogan. I don't, I don't, I don't care enough either way. Um, I will listen to his show 
if they're like every other show, I'll listen to them if they have somebody on I like. You know, I listen to Kelly Slater. I watched Kelly Slater. My friend Jimmy Dore is on. I listen to Jimmy Dore. I'll listen to those guys. I don't have an opinion either way. What started this? What were you saying? Oh, no, I disagree, though. I disagree okay. on the Johnny Carson because, and I could be wrong, um, because he does have his his group of friends. Well, yeah, he, he definitely has on. favorites, but he has other people that he puts on that aren't necessarily part of that circle. Oh, I, I have not seen anybody that I, and again, I'm not a regular listener or watcher. So I, again, I could be wrong. I would say the closest person to Johnny Carson in recent history was at midnight and Chris Hardwick. Okay. That was, there were comics on there who were funny, who don't get stage time in Los Angeles, who don't get to, but they were funny. And I feel like, I feel like at midnight was the more of the Carson able to get you know, I don't know if it well, launched, question, I don't know if it launched anybody's careers. Rogan could probably launch somebody's career. Oh yeah, so you Rogan. might be right on that. But the thing with that midnight is, was Chris Hardwick making <laughs> those calls, or was some producer behind the scenes making the call on who's on there? Well, Chris brought me on. Okay, so um, I don't know if I'm. Sh- but even then, I got bumped. You know, Chris was like, "Yeah, call him, tell him I want you on," and I called him, and he's like, "Great," and then he bumped me for some for somebody else, which is fine. That happens in TV all the time. So, one hundred percent, and that's the problem with. So Chris was making the and again. I don't want to speak out of terms out of uh, out of school. Out of school, thank you. But I believe, yeah, Chris did have because I know I know one person in particular who he had on who I don't think any other show. I know he doesn't. He hasn't done any other TV, so I and I thought that I was I always have so much respect for that guy because the guy's a legend in town. On the flip side, Rogan is also doing a lot more numbers than At Midnight was at its peak. Oh well, you can't even you can't even TV numbers are like it's basic cable numbers are are a joke compared to podcast numbers these days, especially on Comedy Central. No offense to Comedy Central, although they don't hire me anymore, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and now they never will. I know, I know. <laughs> no, but I mean, you could be right. I mean, he could. Be, yeah, you could be right in that. Yeah. But I mean, Carson was, and I caught the tail end of Carson, um, not on it, just watching it. Um, and he, he, it was, you, you, I remember, I remember like, you know, the story is you go on Carson, your calendar is filled for that year. You go on Carson and he invites you to the couch. You're a star. Like that was the big thing. And I remember, I remember I was writing those radio promos at NBC uh, all those years ago when I lived up the street here with the transvestite hooker, Como Sava. And uh, um, my friend did, did uh, and Leno had taken over, and my friend did The Tonight Show. And I was so stoked for her. And the next day I go into NBC and she is a temp at the receptionist's office the next day. And I'm like, wow, that, 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 that day of, of The Tonight Show is over. It's over. And I don't think there's been anything since. And is it, is it blamed on Leno? A lot of people blame Leno for it. Um, cause Leno didn't, and they have their theories, but, and I have my theories also, and I, I'm not here to shit on anybody. Um, but Leno didn't carry that stand up torch and I don't know why people have their own opinions on the, on why he did, but he didn't carry that torch. He didn't have a lot of stand ups on Leno was the fucking God man in the seventies and the eighties that dude, there was no better comic. And this is coming from other comics who are like people I've talked to who were around there. There's like there, you couldn't hold a candle to Leno in those days. And then he gets the, uh, the tonight show and then just does not carry that torch of stand up, and then, you know, let the theories fly. Why? But uh, you know, I don't think anybody's ever gone on record with why it's just pure speculation at this point. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's a drag too, because it never, and then, well then, you know, then, time moves on you know it's like blaming yoko for the beatles you know yoko didn't break up the beatles you know everything everything broke up the beatles you know including drugs yeah exactly including drugs money fighting egos i'm sure yoko had a hand in it but she wasn't you know but you know again again time progresses and so then the 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 late night if you know there's cycles in tv late night was the hot was the hot genre for a while Hour longs with ER was the hot genre for a while. Sitcoms in the eighties were the hot genre for a while. And now, and that was when we only had a few networks. And now, fucking the, dude, I'm hearing like, hey, you know who liked that show? So and so, a platform I never fucking heard of. <laughs> Why don't you sell it to Peacock? <laughs> yeah, Peacock and oh, poor NBC. Boy, they fucking screw the pooch on streaming. How many times have they tried to fucking? They like they launched the boat. a comedy network for like. 30 seconds, didn't they? Dude, they, they didn't do anything. They in, put out a special for Joy Diaz, I thought. Yeah, yeah. They didn't do anything in the beginning. They ignored it. <laughs> and then they tried 
I think they this I think they're on their third yeah. streaming service. Like CISO. That's probably the one yeah, you were CISO, talking about CISO, last yeah, year. Yeah, they Joey got, did something for CISO. Yeah. They got Peacock now, they had CISO. They had like who came up with the name CISO? Come on. I, what the, it's the fuck is this? I, I, I was around here for in the late nineties and I just start, I just started working. I just started writing a TV and I just started getting work as a stand up. And, and I, rem- the dot com boom was every three arts had their own, uh, dot com. Uh, it, NBC didn't have their own dot com. That was the big mistake. And I would just get, I would go in and just write for these websites lasted a year. <laughs> Everything imploded. The dot com crashed. And I don't think NBC ever got their shit together to get it around. And now half their stuff's on, uh, HBO plus. Yep, yep. Well, because that's the problem is in the grand scheme of things, it's like four conglomerates own every fucking every fucking thing. Well, not to get political, but we can take thank Bill Clinton for that. He's the one who who it used to be. Um, uh, uh, um, media outlets could only own four. Media companies can only own like four outlets, and then he deregulated it. That's why. Every fucking pop top forty playlist in America, eighty percent of them had the same playlist. Right, it's all, all iHeartRadio. It's all iHeartRadio. It's all uh, uh, Live Nation. Nation. Who I love Live Nation. I've got nothing to say. Live Nation. They handle tickets. <laughs> <laughs> well, and- but it, you know, but that's it was de- up until Clinton deregulated. That's why we had. That's why now the you know NBC, CSN, CNN has five different news outlets. Fox has five different news. NBC has five different news outlets because we, the, the, they've been deregulated. Well, and on an entertainment standpoint. That's a major problem because you don't have individual tastemakers anymore. Right. So you don't have some dude in Ohio being like, you know what? I dig that new album from so-and-so mm-hmm. and spinning it and then it possibly gaining traction. It's someone at iHeart Corporate telling the whole nation, this is the pop hit you get to hear. Yeah, I know. And that really, I mean, as a, a music guy myself, and I don't want to speak for you, but I assume you are also. Hate it. Hate, you. <laughs> Hate it. You know, it's kind it's almost... It sucks too because I, I talked to and I'm not I, again I'm not telling tales out of school I don't know why I've used that t- uh, phrase nine times I've only used it ten in my life I used it nine today uh, <laughs> out of school episode <laughs> yeah out of school Roller episode <laughs> you know you talk to uh, legendary comedian and radio host here in Los Angeles Fraser Smith and he tells that story about uh, broadcasting out of K Rock in Pasadena David Lee Roth climbs up the fucking fire exit and says hey man can you play my band's tape. He's like, Van Halen? Is that what it is? Like, that doesn't happen anymore, man. Courtney Love was notorious for doing that stuff. That's the, that's where you find the good, good quality stuff. Now, you know, you look on iTunes and you they have 37 writers for one song. It's hilarious. Well, and I, as someone who's a fan of music, but like I literally was interacting with this young metalhead chick yesterday mm-hmm. and she's naming off bands I've never heard. I'm like, I don't even know where I would get exposed to these bands. Yeah. I mean, you, you got to look now you got, you got to look, I don't know the metal out. I'm, I'm kind of an old school metal guy, but I feel like it's that way with anything that's not pop music where, where do you get exposed to new acts that unless they're opening for an act that you're seeing live, Yeah, no more going to like, at least in my youth, I would go to record stores and be like, that has cool album art. Yoink. Yes, yes, yes. Those days are definitely over also, but there's a few, I don't, I don't know of any metal stations like that. There's a few online stations I listen to that, you know, that's me. Sorry. Bump in your chair. You know, they, they, they're listener supported and, 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 um, uh, music is not as expensive as it used to, it, it used to be. So you can, so they can support themselves through listener supporting, um, MTV, I believe killed that like MTV when MTV signed their deal to play the music for the music videos, nobody knew what it was. So they got this overall amazing deal, which drove music prices up because they got for the, like indefinitely, like they signed, you, you got Madonna, you can use this any way you want for this flat rate and it fucked everybody. That's why nobody, that's why all those like wonder years and WKRP and all those DVDs never came out until recently because it was too expensive because they all had, you know, actual uh, music on there. Hell, they re-released Daria. Like I have the box set. Oh, it doesn't have the original music on. Oh, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh man. That's a bummer. It like says in the liner notes, uh, due to licensing, we don't have the original music as part of like, Oh, that sucks. Cause they did that with WKRP originally and it blew and it blew, but then they originally got the licensing with the, how did, the, oh, well, I guess that came out. Daria's a name drop. I know the girl who did Daria's voice. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a bummer that they don't have the original music. on there. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure if they re-release Beavis and Butthead, it won't have all the music videos in it. Oh, well, that's, what's the point? <laughs> that was the best part. Of I know. And I know. <laughs> and it's crazy to think like, Beavis and Butthead broke some bands. Like White Zombie was failing until Beavis and Butthead. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. The Till they 
were like Thunder Kiss 65 rocks. Yeah, yeah. White Zombie was a failing band. Oh, interesting. Oh, God, I love Rob Zombie. What that dude? My, my first, I'm, I'm pretty straight, but that dude's fucking hot. Like that dude's ripped and could put on a show, man. I have two white, I have two Rob Zombie stories. Okay. So one's real minor. My very first show was the Melvins, Reverend Horton Heat, and White Zombie. Nice. <laughs> at the Aragon Ballroom Astro Creep 2000 tour. Yeah, yeah. I had to be like 13 or 14. Like, nice. And I was doing the actual Rob Zombie story. I was doing security at the Ace Hotel at the theater. Uh huh. And he filmed one of his movies in the theater. Okay. He just walked on set like on a day where I wasn't expecting him. I almost threw him off his own set. Right. <laughs> like I opened the door and he just starts walking. I'm like, can I? Oh, shit. That's Rob Zombie. Uh, right this way. Awesome. But he's great. I saw, I'm going to, I'll have a Rob Zombie. Uh, he's friends with a friend of mine who's a comic. And I remember. Chris Hardwick? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't talks about this on air all the okay, time. Okay. All right. Fine. I, I don't like telling other people's stories. And so I remember uh, Chris brought me to his house one time and uh, he, he ended up living down the street from me. And then Chris was in. Night of a Thousand Corpses or The Devil's Rejects, I forget. But he invited me down to Comic Con, me and my wife down to Comic Con, and Rob put on a private show at the House of Blues. And my wife is not a metal. My wife loves music. She loves. She's not anti. She loves, but she's not a metal. She's not a metal girl. And she was like, "Nah, we'll go, <laughs> we'll go." And she was like, "This is great. Like he put, he's such a great performer and such a great. And I like I like his music because." You, you got he's got a fucking ass shaking groove under it too it's metal but you can fucking swing your hips to it and I, I like his stuff a lot that whole band is like a bunch of art school rejects like that's oh, how really? white zombie started john five and all the oh no john five's his guitar player now i don't know who else was in white zombie. Uh, it was um <coughs> rob sean new salt on bass okay i can't remember the original lineup but like they're all in like art school together oh that makes sense and like yeah we're all kind of art school rejects and oh and his, his brother was in uh power man 5000 yes i had i did a i wrote a show uh with uh jimmy iovine and doug morris were the executive producers and we had power man 5000 on and god that was a good show dr dre was the executive producer so we had the uh uh nwa reunion with snoop filling in for easy nice so the only time the I don't like smoking pot, but as an opportunist, I smoked pot in that green room instantly went home. <laughs> yeah. How could you not like, I, I feel like no matter who you are, if Snoop Dogg hands you a joint, you kind of have to do it. I believe even exhibit handed me a joint and I was like, okay, <laughs> I believe it was exhibit. I, I would absolutely without fail, make some bad pimp my ride joke as he's handing me that joint. It was probably pimp my ride. Air. It was 2001 so i think pimp my ride was still on right yeah 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 so it was probably pimp my ride we had it we had it we had, i got a picture of me and eminem and uh i'm like em can i get a picture he's like sure man i'm like great i'm gonna send it to my mom and he's like both guns <laughs> just birds up <laughs> flipping off my mom <laughs> how'd your mom like that i didn't send it to her oh my mom's still a good christian woman she's gonna hate this podcast she's gonna listen oh. <laughs> no i don't think my mom's ever listened to anything i've ever done is that disappointing? Are we going to go down that road now? A little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, let me we're lay good, down. Good. Let me lay down. No, dude, she doesn't, you know, again, I grew up in a, my dad was a born again preacher. Like entertainment business is so far away from, but if you think about it, a comic and a preacher, are very similar, <laughs> you know, like we're, it's funny. Like I'll talk to my dad. He's retired now, but he'll, he'll pick up dates. He's like, yeah, I picked up a wedding next. I'm like, like I do. Yeah. I picked up uh, the laugh factory Tuesday. Oh, yeah. I picked up a wedding and two funerals next week. So, you know, months looking good. <laughs> it really is foreign for like parents and all that shit for the understand entertainment. It's, mm -hmm. As someone who's like, so like working, but struggling at times I get people like, well, why don't you go just get a job? Did yeah. you ever get that like early on? Uh, yeah. I mean, I always, I had jobs. Yeah. You know, I've, I didn't, you know, I'm not skilled at anything. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's such a weird business. Our, our, like, here's the deal. All right. My dad was a preacher somehow. I think, and I could be wrong. Somehow his, his accountant fucked him and he got screwed and owed the IRS a ton of money. Uh, you know, you, trust me, there is a difference between the Joel Osteens of the world and the regular preachers who are actually in it because they believe it. You know what I mean? There's a big difference. So they're constantly getting fucked by the IR, you know, because they don't have the, they're like teachers. They don't have those, you know, they have weird clauses. And so he went to work on, on his only day off on Fridays to make money. And that was respectable. If you're in this business and you have an extra job to make money to feed your kid, <laughs> ah, what a loser. Yep. You're obviously not. A, <laughs> you're obviously not good at what you do. Exactly. You're always, oh, you're teaching kids. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> yeah. 
it's I, I have no shame. And it's like, I don't think I've ever had a Tapo Chico. I'm sorry, may I have it? Yeah, it's not a twist off. Okay. Uh, it's a horn. Is it a devil horn? No, I bought that in South Africa. Okay. Is it, where's it been? I have no fucking idea. Well, I mean, places. I know. I, have, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some of your guests. <laughs> Salud. Salud. <laughs> Oh, that's not bad. It's like a Sprite. Yeah, but it's just water. Yeah. How have I lived in Southern California and never had a Topo Chico? It's a Texas thing, actually. Oh, it is? Yeah. Because I've only seen it when I, when I moved out here. Yeah, the, the, it's a Texas-Mexico thing. Okay. All right. But back on the, you know, being unsuccessful entertainer, everyone who's not, like, really booking all the fucking time is working other fucking jobs in this town. Mm-hmm. And, like, I have no shame about it. Like, I work whatever I got to work to fucking... Put food on the fucking table while I'm hustling. At least I didn't give up and you know work some fucking job I hate. Yeah, no, and that happens too. I mean, it's, it's an under you know people 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 think you go to you go to Hollywood and you fucking make it or you don't, and that means you move to Hollywood and you're Brad Pitt or you're not. There are hundreds of thousands of working actors, comedians, writers. Even podcasters, I can say now, you've never heard of. They make a decent living. They got a good following. They're they're they're, they're happy with what they're doing, you know. But I mean, even my mom, like she doesn't like she didn't understand. Like, what do you mean you're writing for her? <laughs> Tell him, well, he doesn't do that. And I'm like, no, there's like twelve. There's twelve writers for that host. You know, like you know, they, people just don't understand. They just see the finished product and like, oh, it's magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're not on screen, and I I, did, I have not done a lot of on-screen stuff because I, I I'm a writer, so I don't do a lot of on-screen stuff. And so my parents don't understand. Well, you obviously don't like being on camera. So. I, don't like, I do like if I know it. I do like if I know it. Don't think I haven't been side-eyeing my jacket here. <laughs> <laughs> way, again, way too old to be this vain. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's A-OK to be this old in this vein. It's It's... You, know, yeah. you can say hey, you're 10 years younger than me. Fair. <laughs> uh, by and the it, way. In much worse shape. So, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thank you for having me. I don't think I told you. I am so glad and, to be talking to an adult with alcohol where I can cut. I've, I've been, my wife's working on a movie. She's gone every day. I've been watching my nine-year-old for the last, for, I was homeschooling during the pandemic. So I, it's nice to fucking say fuck. It's nice to smell some whiskey, although I do wish I was drinking it. I mean, you can. I know, I know. Not yet, not yet. Soon, though. I mean, we're celebrating here. We are. We're celebrating. It's celebrating. It's nice to come back and and relive these memories of, I mean, I spent so much time in this neighborhood. I literally got, I mean, I know, I don't know if you can, I literally got excited when I pulled him like, Bronson, oh my God, oh, this is great. (laughs) I spent so much time here. This is fantastic. I mean, Johnny Knoxville used to live up the street when I I used to, I just did a, told a story about him when we used to. Uh, wait tables together when his, he was still PJ. We used to wait tables together and because uh, he lived over here and he would work in the Brentwood one and I would work at the Sunset one. And we'd share, we, we played football over there. Oh, it was great. That's awesome. It was great. Brad Pitt still lives up there, I think. Uh, oh, I danced with <laughs> I'm not going home because I'm going home to a nine year old. So get fucking comfortable, people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I danced with uh, Marissa Tomei. Um, all right. So I had a, after, uh, I started working, I lived on Bronson, a little shitty apartment, like the only shitty apartment North of Franklin on Bronson at the time. Like it was like, like people dropped me off like, Oh, this is a nice neighborhood. Oh, you live there. Okay. (laughs) But then I started working and then I moved onto this, uh, road called Beachwood Canyon. And for the listeners who don't live in Los Angeles and Beachwood Canyon, if you ever see any pictures of the Hollywood sign, that's the road that goes up. And back then it was the farther you lived up Beachwood was the more successful you were, you know? So I started out on the first block and then as I got more money, I got a nicer apartment. Then I ended up uh, in an apartment across from the store. And my friend was like, Hey man, we're going to a party at Rosie Perez's house. And I'm like, Oh shit. You knew if I fucked with this long enough, I'd break it. Right. Yep. Hold on. Oh, it's just a twist. Yeah. It's just a twist. Murray's just breaking my equipment. I know. I know. I just like, yeah, I've been talking about doing your show for like four years. I'm, a, I'm just going to come here and, <laughs> and just And I just break commented shit. on your mic. I'm like, oh, these are nice and expensive. Break. <laughs> Throw them on the table real quick. Like, fuck you, Matt. No <laughs> podcast competition. Why don't you go by Slayer? I do for a lot of people. Okay, good. Because that's a fucking badass nickname, man. I was thinking it's on a the stage way- name, not a nickname, sir. Oh, uh, well, the nickname is a stage name. A nickname is a fancy name for a stage. Uh, I mean, it, uh, honestly, sorry, it is my high school nickname. So, Oh, there you go. It literally 
like day one on a porn set, they're like, what do we put you down as? I'm like, uh, Matt Slayer. Sure. Perfect. I love it. That's a good <laughs> nickname. Like, I can't believe The Rock wants to be called Dwayne. Like, you got a fucking cool nickname. Run with it, dude. Yeah, but I think he just wants to get under from under Vince McMahon's thumb. And The Rock is... Does Vince own The Rock? I'm sure. I'm sure he's got to have a taste of everything The Rock does, right? Exactly. From what little I know about professional wrestling, I know McMahon's a bit of a douche. Yeah, I, I'm sure he is. He's just like, oh, yeah, I get a kickback on every fucking movie you do. Yeah, yeah. Rock. He is the Lorne Michaels of wrestling. He really is. Or is Lorne Michaels the Vince McMahon of comedy? Oh, it would have to be Vince McMahon with Lorne Michaels because Lorne Michaels was before Vince. Was he? Well, didn't Vince's dad kind of break uh, wrestling? Yeah. I mean, he, Vince, well, Vince Sr. Vince Sr. took it from local to national. Is that correct? If I remember correctly? Yeah. Okay. So I guess Lorne Michaels would be the Vince Sr., right? I guess. I'm, I guess. I'm speaking from what I know from but, just I mean, watching Vince the Andre Jr. the Giant. But I mean, Vince Sr. was definitely uh, involved in the early 80s. So like, yeah, know, yeah. it's all around the same time. And in the grand scheme of things, I think Vince made a little more money than Lauren did. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Dude, Lauren's got his fucking finger in everything. But Vince was a full on billionaire at points. Oh, okay. That's true. That's true. I, I honestly, I don't know the wrestling world that well, but I'm, I'm sure Vince is doing fine. Oh, I'm sure they both are. <laughs> I, I'm sure they both are. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I got, I only got into wrestling for a little bit during the uh, rock and roll, uh, the rock and wrestling connection with Cindy Lauper and like the WrestleMania three era. WrestleMania. I remember the first WrestleMania. Was the first WrestleMania where uh, Hulk Hogan uh, beat Andre? No, that's is WrestleMania that, three. Is that three? Yep. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. My dad, my dad, my grandfather was an Italian and lived in Philly. Like, grew up in the Philly area, so he I, he was always talking about hanging out with Gorilla Monsoon and Gorgeous George back in the fifties and sixties. And every time we went over there, we'd have to watch local wrestling. <laughs> I'm not much into wrestling as a product these days, but wrestlers. In a lot of cases, this used to be more rock and roll than rock and rollers at times. Oh, th- yeah. There was a whole show that went on with those, especially those early guys, man. Those early guys. And, you know, with the costumes and the, and the stage presence and the egos and the entries. The in- Entering the ring was a fucking a whole, a whole thing, man. And fucking 300 nights on the road. Oh, dude. Girls in every town drinking, partying. Dude, man. My, my favorite wrestler growing up was Superfly Jimmy Snuka. The murderer? No, no. I don't oh, yes. think so. Oh, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Snuka what? allegedly murdered. Are you sure? My next wife, yeah. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I will let's, I will Google this right now. Okay, Google it. Are you really? You're yeah. Not, you're not thinking of Gator from the skating world, are you? No. Gator, the uh, professional skater, murdered his girlfriend. The fabled pro wrestler slipped away from for good on January 3rd, 2017, when Judge Kelly Bennett of the Pennsylvania Court of Common Pleas declared him mentally incompetent to stand trial on counts of third degree murder and manslaughter. Like I said, my favorite wrestler is Andre the Giant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a whole... How did I miss that? Didn't he just die recently too? Yeah, he died a couple years ago, but yeah. he was on trial for murder at the time. So this whole article is how Jimmy Snooker got away with murder and how Alan Tall Morning Call helped cover up the historical ongoing corruption in Lehigh County criminal justice. Like, how did he kill her? Did he do a a, a flying headbutt off the top turnbuckle? <laughs> you, there's a dark side of the ring on Jimmy Snuka. Vice Vice has put out a whole series. Even if you're not into wrestling, called Dark Side of the Ring. Okay, which is real entertaining. Oh, like, I bet. J- just telling like road stories and like just fucked up events from pro wrestling. I'm sure, man. And Jimmy Snuka's murder. Wow, I had no idea. So anyway, on to Andre the Giant. <laughs> <laughs> I do love Andre the Giant. <laughs> And just fucking massive alcohol who used to piss himself. Dude, he used to, where did he grow up in Austria or France? I France, forget. France. France. He used to get uh, driven to school by um, Samuel Beckett, the playwright, because he couldn't, he couldn't fit in the bus. So he'd have to walk. And his neighbor was this, pl- this hugely famous playwright, Samuel Beckett. And he would pick him up and he would drive him to school and they would talk about cricket. <laughs> <laughs> Why would anyone want to talk about cricket? I don't, know. I don't know. I don't know. That was I that Andre the Giant documentary. Uh, it's funny. Two things. I looked forward to it, and that that was literally that night. I realized something was wrong with me in my heart. Like I came home. I remember my wife went out on like a ladies' night out, and I had already had that cough, and I was having a hard time breathing. And I was watching that, and I was laying on my couch, and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. 
And I had to stop the movie and like kind of get up and get, put my head between my knees and like, bring oxygen in, bring oxygen into my, and then the next day I went to the doctor. So, but the, that's the only thing I remember that. And that I was hugely disappointed in that documentary because it only focused on the uh, wrestling part and didn't even touch on the early days of like Austria. Like Samuel, that gave me driven to school and Samuel, Beck, even if you're not into plays, that's pretty fucking cool. That is, that's amazing. It was an amazing anecdote. But then I looked at who produced it. I'm like, oh, of course it was McMahon. And right. With OWF, of course it's all about wrestling. That makes sense now. Yeah. And in reality, like, yeah, Andre was apparently a fairly big ladies' man too. Like some poor broad under that under oh. that massive man. Assuming he's on top, how do you how do you get on top? I, I would have I would imagine you have to go cow, cowgirl on that. But still, how do you straddle? I don't know. Should we try it? I mean, neither one of us are that big. We would have to put like two of them. We we'll get some pillows. <laughs> We're gonna build a, a, a Andre out of pillows. And try to... <laughs> That's how happy I am to be out of the house. I'm willing to do that right now. <laughs> I'm All really- right, well, there's the Patreon <laughs> content of this episode. <laughs> Murray tried to do reverse cowgirl on a bunch of pillows. <laughs> did you ever see? I did you ever see that the, the wrestler? Did you ever see that with oh, uh, yeah. Mickey Rourke? Um, there was. I found out later that this was all uh, put on. I ended up there's a a comic slash wrestler out of uh, San Diego. I did that Mexico tour with him, um, and uh, we had to get on a bus and take take an hour ride bus in Mexico, and I learned all about wrestling. More than I wanted to know. And uh, we were talking about The Wrestler. And I remember seeing Mickey work on, <clears throat> I don't know, some one of the late night talks. Maybe, who's the guy who just died? King? Um, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, uh, fuck. The news cat, the broadcaster. Oh, Larry King? Yes, thank you. God, I can't remember a fucking thing today. I saw him on Larry King and he was talking about, you know, yeah, wrestling. It's all bullshit like that. And then Chris Jer- he had Chris Jericho call in. And Chris Jericho was like, Oh no, he, I remember now, uh, Mickey Rourke was initially saying how wrestling was all a joke and it was all put on and all bullshit. And then he, as he trained, he's like, Oh, you know what? These, these guys are really athletes. They're really well trained, whether it's a show or not, these guys are athletes. So Chris Jericho comes on and he's like, you think we're all fucking actors? You want to step into the ring? And, and, and Mickey Rourke was like, look, man, I, you know, I, I'm apologizing here. And Ricky's Ricky. <laughs> He's no fucking, he's no slouch. He's no puss, right? right. He, he was a semi-pro boxer at one point. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah and he, he's like, listen, you know, I was wrong, man. I was wrong. I, I thought this was all a joke. I thought this was all a put on. He's like, anytime you want to f- step in the ring, Jericho, anytime you want to step in the ring and you want to go up against a real wrestler, actor, you f- you come talk to me. He's like, look, man, I, again, I apologize. If he, he's like, anytime. He's like, well, I, I, you know, you, I, I'm just an actor. But if you want to go bare fist knuckled in the alley, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> And then I found out that was all fucking put on. Oh, oh, it, it's all work. It was all work. And it, oh. he was playing the heel. And I, and I was like, oh, man, good, good, though. Good for you. You know what was interesting else about that movie? Marissa Tomei was in it. Brings it back to my story. Oh, yeah. I actually <laughs> wanted to hear about you dancing about Marissa Tomei. I, I'm hoping that we're going to have to tell your wife to ear muff it for a second of part of the story. Only if that sto- the story was that good. <laughs> so I go... My friend calls me to go to uh, Rosie Perez's party, and uh, and she lived a, like two blocks from me up on Beachwood. Like I'd never seen her, I never. And so we, we walked over there. We go in. There's music. There's dancing. I hop on the dance floor. I'm not gonna lie, Slayer. I can dance. I'm not gonna lie. I can. I can. I can move it when I need to. And uh, Marissa Homey's there, and I fuck and I saunter over, lay, you know, start dancing with her. She's dancing with me, and she's looking just as adorable as marissa toe can look i mean she looks hot as balls to this day she is a she is a handsome woman as letterman would say and we dance and i'm like i am dancing with marissa tomei this is did good. you know who she was at the time oh yeah i knew who she was like this is post my cousin Vinny. Uh, how old am i <laughs> this is 2000 i think it was okay okay when was my cousin Vinny? early 90s mid 90s oh, okay maybe it's not that old um yeah, it's way post. Uh, yeah, I knew who she was, and she was having a good time, and we we're dancing. And I'm like, "This is I'm fucking dancing. I'm gonna. This is I'm getting her number. I'm gonna date Marissa. This is gonna be great." Song ends. Whoosh, she turns, walks out. Never see her again. That's a shame. I know. But for three and a half minutes, I thought for sure I was gonna be Mr. Marissa Tomei. Didn't even try to get her number. Mm-hmm. She turned and left. Like I couldn't even like. I couldn't even like, hey, thanks for the dance. Like up and got, like I'm sure I was like the 900th guy who tried to dance with her at that party that night. But you could have been the first to get her number. Oh, or yes, I could have. Didn't put in the work, Murray. <laughs> I know, I know. You could have been at home right now 
homeschooling Marissa Tomei's child. <laughs> While she's off doing Spider Man, right? Ooh, is she in the Spider Man? I mean, she's playing Aunt May in the last couple Spider Man. Oh yeah, I haven't been. On, I haven't seen a Spider Man movie in a long time. Yeah, they got her hot ass to play Aunt May. Like, okay, interesting casting. I'm okay with it. All right, I'm assuming ants are normally not uh, young, good looking women in the uh, comic book world. Well, Aunt May like is old, gray hair. Okay, <laughs> yeah, forever. yeah. I would imagine, yeah. And they made a whole bit of it, like in the modern Spider Man's of like Tony Stark hitting on her. Oh yeah. <laughs> So your aunt, she's single? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. She looks amazing for 56. Is she 56? Yep. Just yeah. Googled it. Yeah. This is a good, that was a good... I actually watched um, My Cousin Vinny during lockdown. It's not that. It was pretty good. Yeah, that movie super holds up. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's nice to see... Uh, what's his face? Who's the lead guy in it? Joe Pesci. Joe Pesci not be an asshole that you hate because you hate him in every fucking movie. He's you hate him in casino. You hate him in everything. The uh, boxer movie. You hate him in everything. So it was nice to, I mean, I didn't really hate him in that. Um, the Irishman. Oh yeah. I didn't see it. How'd you not see that movie? Uh, I didn't turn it on. <laughs> I just heard it was really long. It is really long. And I, you know, I think I tried to watch it and I saw the real bad CG of the faces and I was like, I'm not into this yeah, right now. That, that was a weird choice on my part. It's like, we know what young De Niro looks like. That's yeah. not young De Niro. Yeah. 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 I remember when they did that in the Sopranos when the mom died and then the next season they CG'd her face onto a, somebody else's body. That was a little weird. They CG'd oh, fuck. Princess Leia in like the last couple Star Wars movies. I'm not saying that wasn't weird either. <laughs> but that was much better done than weird the aged De Niro that didn't look like young De Niro. Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to say, you know, that stuff advances so quickly, but there's only like two years difference in right. the time of those. <laughs> and the Irishman came after. <laughs> oh, it did? <laughs> I think, and Hollywood does a lot of great things, uh, uh, amazing effects, but they, they, I don't think they're as good as they think they are yet. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think, especially in that Star Wars with the birth of Darth Vader, like the ending when they go back to the aesthetic of the original Star Wars looked more believable than the last two and a half hours we just watched. I mean, I don't think they know there's, I think they think their stuff is better than it is. But that's always been the case. I mean, back when the 80s and 90s, there's crazy claymation and shit like that. It's like, yeah. oh, this is supposed to look believable. But I, I'm a, I'm not a sci science fiction guy, but Star Wars is my favorite movie and I watch it probably once a month. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get hate mail on that one. Shit. <laughs> the original, the original. I I, I bowed out after the first three. They're uh, still not great. They're not great movies. The original Star Wars is fantastic. What is wrong with it? That script. Now I got to put on my writer's hat. That script is the was the basis of almost every action movie for years after that. Well, any actually take that back. Not any action movie. Movies in general. That store. That structure. That storyline. Yeah. And a lot of those were shit too. <laughs> All right, well, that I can't argue with you. Of course, that's it. But, like, oh, hey, shit. Uh, you know how you know how you know Star Wars is a good movie? 40 fucking years later, we're still talking about it. Oh, it inspires emotions. And it's so such a part of so many people's childhoods that they're just caught up in the rose colored glasses and nostalgia about it. Oh, I could see your argument on that, but not with me. Okay. But I will say this. It was the first movie I saw in the movie theater. See? <laughs> so, so every movie I've seen since then has to go through the eyes of like a five-year-old seeing Star Wars for the first right. time. Right. And uh, there are redeeming qualities of the original trilogy, but like A New Hope's a fucking mess. A New Hope is not a mess. It's just, What's a mess about it? Lucas had no plan. Well, hold on. Are you, if you, are look you getting if, A New Hope confused with... No, no. If you look at A New Hope and then watch... Empire and Jedi. Okay. It's very obvious that Lucas had no plan for beyond a new hope. Oh, now that I disagree with. Cause I think, and I could be wrong on this. Oh, Luke and Leia making out. And then all of a sudden they're siblings. Come on. Well, <laughs> come on. also there's that classic line of, uh, uh, Obi-Wan saying, I don't ever remember owning a droid. And right. The whole back three are based on him owning a droid. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be holes in that. I mean, that, yeah, but that but how do you have holes in any trilogy though? I as think. a writer, how do you have holes when you've already established stuff? Like it's there for reference. Yeah. Listen, you're not going to, you're not going to find anybody who thinks Lucas is an amazing writer. It's when, it's when Lawrence Kasdan comes in and starts writing, uh, uh, empire and those one. That's, that's the one that's the real hardcore star Wars fans are, are the ones who like that. So Lucas isn't exactly the greatest writer. He's a really good at hire. He's really good at hiring good writers or he used to be anyway. <laughs> but even then the inconsistencies between all the fucking movies, like even the first trilogy has a bunch of inconsistencies in it. 
So is the Bible. That fucking thing's still around. Yeah, I don't believe in that either. <laughs> so, but they're small inconsistencies. It's not like. I guess the whole incest part maybe might be the big one. You I might mean, have a point there. Maybe he was just predicting future Pornhub. I don't know. <laughs> like, in the future, people will super be into this. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. Anyway, sorry, it's still my favorite movie. I don't care. You can poke all the holes in it you want. I will. I can. <laughs> I mean, you can look around the corner. I, I'm. You have I, anti-Star Wars material behind this curtain? No, just a lot of movies. Oh, okay. A lot of fun Are you a big movies. movie buff? Yeah. Oh, okay. What's your favorite? I'm sorry if your listeners already know this. I apologize. I don't have a, okay. all favorites. <clears throat> like, favorite genre i'm i'm into sci-fi and thrillers mm-hmm. um even though it has a bunch of problems with it and a lot of 90s cheese i'm a big fan of Catherine bigelow's strange days okay sure ralph fines like i that movie doesn't get enough credit okay have you All ever right. seen it uh yeah i think i when it came out yeah yeah i could never get the part uh past the part of him pronouncing his name ralph rafe, oh, rafe or whatever rafe. the fuck it was <laughs> uh children of men Children of Men is an amazing film. You know, I never saw it, but I know what you're talking about. How have you never seen that movie? I, there are, all right, first of all, growing up, I wasn't allowed to see movies. As a matter of fact, when I saw Star Wars, somebody else had to take me because my You dad, were definitely an adult when Children of Men came out. I know, but hold on. I'm getting to the point of what I'm saying. So there are a lot of holes in movies. There are a lot of, and also come the 90s. I started doing stand up and stuff like that. So I was broke. So, and I wasn't around. And I eventually learned the matinee and the beauty of what I call the daytime movie, which is the only time I'll fucking see a movie and not on a fucking Saturday night anymore. Oh, hell no. Now, on the road, two o'clock in the afternoon, go see a movie absolutely. by yourself. Absolutely. Maybe wear pants, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Dude, one time I snuck Chinese food in to the movie. And, and I had a big bag and like, and the, never sneak Chinese food into a movie because the whole time during the movie, all I heard was people around me going, do you smell Chinese food? Do you smell Chinese food? Is somebody <laughs> Chinese food here? Just, I'm like slurping up. <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing visual. That is just... It's not, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm like, Oh, I'll just get Chinese food and I'll sneak it in. I don't know what I was thinking. Like, how do you sneak Chinese food? Like, how do you just put it? You don't have a purse. Like, I had a bag. I had a, this was, I, this was, this is when I lived here. <laughs> this is when I lived up here. I was waiting tables down on Melrose and I would take a bus and I'd have my bag with me. Cause I had to, I didn't have a unit. This was a great restaurant. It was a uh, European owned. So you could, you couldn't go in like this, but you could go in like that. You could work. You could wait tables in jeans and a t-shirt. You didn't have a uniform. So I would just put my clothes in and it was like in New York, you know, you, when you leave New York, you put your stuff in your backpack, you leave for the day. This is what I, here. I would just put my stuff in the backpack or in the bag, hop the bus, go watch a movie, then uh, go take the bus to the table. And so I'm like, I'm going to get Chinese food and put it in my bag. And then of course the fucking sauce leaked all over my bag and my bag smelled like Chinese food until I got rid of it. <laughs> Good planning all around. Uh, absolutely. 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 I'm not here to judge. Don't judge me. Besides star Wars, what else movies wise are you into? Uh, believe, I've, I've really grown not into movies. I really, I will watch any rock doc though. I will watch any rock doc. You, I don't care if it's on vanilla ice. I'll watch it. Oh, the vanilla ice ones are actually pretty entertaining. I would imagine they would be. I haven't seen it, but I would imagine they would. Well, be. I mean, there, there's the whole thing of like, you know, being a white guy in the late eighties, trying to be in the rap game and then like getting shook down by Shook Knight over a balcony for his. You know, oh, that's season. right. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. There's some drama there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it's almost, it's almost like the 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 crappy acts, like Vanilla Ice. And yeah, I said it. <laughs> the crappy acts. I don't like, think anyone looks back at Vanilla Ice. And be like, <laughs> Vanilla Ice changed a generation. Those are fighting words, motherfucker. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure those are the ones that those are the ones that make the best stories. You know, you don't want to. I remember my buddy used to do a bit about creeds behind the music. <laughs> He's like. He's like, that's when we found God. I'm like, that's when I'm leaving this show. <laughs> like, did you, have you seen the show? We want the drugs. We want the hookers. We want the near death experiences. We don't want, we want Suge Knight shaking you down, hanging you out of the fucking balcony. We don't want, you know, everything was we a sweet ride. We want Garrett killing a friend. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Leaf Garrett getting arrested on the train here in Los Angeles for, was it heroin? Yeah, I want to say heroin. I think it was. What happened to Behind the Music? I missed that show. It was a good, it was a good show. I did that whole Viacom, uh, MTV, VH1 just really fucking shot themselves in the foot. I started working, writing shows at MTV kind of like right when they stopped, like 2000, 2001, they stopped airing music. And and then, and I, I wrote I wrote on the first, I believe, and if I put a hundred bucks on it, I'm pretty, 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I wrote on the first game show that included the internet. It was called Web Riot on MTV. And we were still doing music videos and like doing, it was trivia. And Ahmet Zappa hosted it. And I remember that. Yeah. 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 And so we'd write jokes. It was perfect for me. Music, comedy, it was great. And then like the next day, reality TV hit. And then the next, the next thing I'm writing on is date my mom and next. And I'm like, I, if you would have told 13 year old Murray <laughs> that he was working at MTV, he would be so elated, but here I am and I'm fucking miserable. Why are we not doing music? What is happening here? Why, why am I writing jokes for moms from Minnesota who can't fucking deliver them? So yeah, so that whole VH1 MTV, they all just kind of imploded into themselves and I, I don't know why. I don't Some know why. Executive. Some lawyer. Oh yeah. I know we can make more money, but I don't, I don't even, is VH1 even still in, I don't even I don't even have one still exists. Yeah, I must. Right. Cause I cut my cable a while ago, so I haven't even seen. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I, even, I don't even know if each one, I know MTV still around cause I did. Cause I know ridiculousness is now 90% of their programming. 24 yeah. seven. <coughs> now West coast. Yeah. Awkwardly laughing at things that are on the internet. <laughs> I did the first season of ridiculousness. I did the first se- first two seasons, first season is ridiculous. And then I, I consulted on the second season. And, uh, how was that? That laugh still haunts me. <laughs> it was good. I look great guys. I uh, great guys. Um, Dick House is the guys who uh, started um, Jackass. It's a production company behind it, and I, I ran into Johnny Knoxville, and, and we talked about uh, waiting tables over at Chin Chin over in Brentwood and stuff. And this football game we played with the Jackass guys it was fun. Uh, but it was a great. I mean, it was a. Uh, it was tough because, Dear Dick. Is, was already a fucking staple on MTV. So, and he had the same executive producers and both great Shane and Christian. Uh, those guys are awesome, but it was, they wanted it done their own way. And they brought us in cause I had already written a bunch of clip shows and stuff like that. And so they brought us in to kind of help launch it and I could navigate it and I ended up navigating it. But the two guy, other guys they brought in, they got fired. Like almost they, they didn't get asked. I was the only one who got asked back the next season. Cause they just couldn't, they couldn't navigate the room. Like I'm like, like, as soon as I got in there, I'm like, oh, this is their world. I'm just going to roll with it. I'm not coming in to change their world. And these guys wanted, oh, this is how you do it. And I'm like, mm, this is how they do it. Let's do it their way. Yeah. How big is your fucking ego? Like, oh, these guys are bringing us on. We're going to tell them how to do the fucking thing. Well, in their defense, we were, I mean, th- it was me and maybe two or three other guys who were jumping around from, this is when clip shows were really hot. We're jumping around from clip show to clip. I mean, for like six years, I didn't have to worry about work. It was great. Um, so we were jumping around, we were doing a pilot for this network and then a pilot for that network. And then, and so then MTV calls. And so we go over there. And so we had already established ourselves on how to, how these things are worked. And, but I, I can, I can read a room pretty well. It's one of my only talents. <laughs> so, um, so I, I adapted really quickly and the, and the other, the other guy got, can't got demoted. And then the other guy stayed with me and then they both got canned. And then I went back, I think if I remember correctly. But one other guy is a big fucking executive now, so he's got no problems. Yeah, he's like, I landed on my feet. Mm -hmm. How about you, Murray? How are you doing? Yeah, I know. Well, I'm in the middle of Hollywood reminiscing about hanging out with transvestite hookers on the corner taking... (laughs) Glory days. (laughs) They'll pass you by. Glory days. Getting all lit on Topo Chico. There's still whiskey right in front of you. <laughs> I'm a Scotch guy. That that might be. I mean, the, oh, the, shut it. The, the, I the see it. Don't think I didn't fucking notice that when I walked in. <laughs> oh, I know you did. I know you did. I know you did. We had some nice. Uh, I had some nice Scotch at the podcast festival, I believe. I definitely brought bourbon. I brought Scotch. Oh, you did. You did. Yes, I brought Scotch. That was that was at the was that seventeen. A, so that was at the hotel, the down, the Biltmore. Yeah, the Biltmore downtown. Yeah. Oh, I ran up. I know. Who well, I ran up quite a tab that weekend. I Holy too. shit! I, I mean, I brought my own bottles, and I still. <laughs> I remember my cousin randomly was randomly in town and I'm like, well, I'm doing this podcast, but I was doing my, the, the, my road stories podcast that night. And I always picked the, the, um, Friday night, 11 o'clock slot. I always picked it. I always asked for it because, um, all the Saturday big shows were, were all the big shows were on Saturday, you know, like all the big draws, but people were coming in on Fridays and nobody wanted those Friday slots, everybody wanted the Saturdays. I'm like, give me the Friday and I'll get the guys who are on Saturday and Sunday as my guests. So the people who came, so my shows were always packed because I had the weekend guys and then they could go see, you know, Mark Maron or Jimmy Pardo or all those guys on Saturday Doug and Sunday. Movies. Doug loves movies, Jimmy Dore. So I had I'm the last, that one I had Jimmy Dore and Paul Gilmartin on and my cousin was there and I met her, I kept making her go to the bar, like <laughs> just like in the middle of the show, like, hey, Go get us two vodkas on the rocks. We got fucking Ray and a tab up that. That was great. Oh, you and I did a fair amount of drinking when you were on. Oh yeah, totally. That was, it was, I mean, 
I almost even got a hotel room that one night. <laughs> and I live in this town. But thank God, my friend Darcy, my friend Darcy, I love her very much. If she's listening, she was dry. She drove. She was very, she got a hotel room. That's right. She got a hotel room there because she lives down in Orange County, but she would pick me up. Very nice of her. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember like I was sitting in the podcast room and you came by and like saw the bottle like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I do miss that festival. I really, as we were talking about earlier, I really wish it would come back. I, yeah, well, have, maybe it will in a, in some sort of a form or not. I mean, it's it's, you know. Podcasting isn't going anywhere, so. Yeah, but I, I look at the other festivals like uh, Podcast Movement and stuff like that. And it's just like, I'm not sure I really want to attend this versus like how LA Podfest was. Well, I know they got, and again, um, from what I heard, I don't know if this is factual. I know, uh, I want to say Live Nation got involved in a podcast, a similar, a podcast festival at the same time at, but they had, they had Live Nation money behind it. So they were paying Mark Marin and they were paying like, um, What's that big before cereal? Maybe it was cereal. My like, favorite murder? Or? No, before my favorite murder. Uh, I forget, but it was like cereal and like my favorite murder or something. So they were paying those guys big money to come do their festival, but they're also charging meet and greets with for like fifty bucks. You can meet Mark Marin or you can meet you know the cereal guys and and stuff. And I think that really put. And the good thing about the LA Podcast Festival was like, hang out. Mark's gonna walk by. I'm going to walk by. Sullen's going to walk by. Slayer's going to walk by, hang out with, you know, watch them do this. There, you know, oh, there, yeah, was, no. there was no pretension in that. Festival. No, not at all. Like I, Podfest 17, I had you on, I had Bert on, mm -hmm. I had Barry Katz on. Nice. <laughs> Which having Barry Katz on, I'd like talking with Barry was hilarious because Bobby Lee, for whatever reason, thought I was somebody at some point because I'm sitting there <laughs> talking with Barry and Bobby's talking to me like, I'm somebody like hey what's going on bobby like i've met bobby like passing at the store but since i'm talking to barry he's like oh that dude must be some like <laughs> from that point forward whenever i'd run into bobby he's like hey what's going on man like <laughs> dude i am just some shitbag podcaster i'm not even a comic but i didn't even see barry cats there that's funny yeah i had barry on i had you on i had uh sam levine on sam yeah 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 sam levine what, what did you oh Cry crusher's great dude man that guy's that guy is that guy that guy's laugh can change the dynamic of a room. You know what I mean? It bums me out because he was on Sober October when I had him on there. Oh, right, right. Like, I'm like, I, I pretty much bought this for trick with you, Bert. <laughs> he's just like, yeah, it's Sober October. Oh, I, get, I did give him a Cuban, though. Oh, there you go. That's awesome. And Bert is supposed to have come and done a full episode at some mm -hmm. point, And like, pretty much, is, yeah, it's, it's never really panned out. Yeah. And every once in a while, I'll text him like, hey, you want to come? I did like get home from the bar, get home from the bar at like two o'clock in the morning, saw him tweeting at one point and some of my friends had given him shit, like ran into him at a bar in the Valley uh -huh. by his place and like gave him shit for not coming to do the show. Oh, really? <laughs> and I had gotten home after they told me they had given him shit the night before. Saw him tweeting at 2am. I was a little drunk. I'd like kind of drunk texted Bert like, yeah. Hey, it's Matt Slayer from and now we drink. Like you still want to come do the show? He's like, yeah, let's do it. Obviously it still never happened. But right. Uh, he's, I mean, he's a man, but he's not a bullshitter. So, you know, he's also super fucking busy. Oh, I know. No, no. It's like, became like, he's, I don't know. He's not quite times man of the year, but he's getting there. No, no. I fully understand Bert is super busy. Like, I'm just giving him a little shit on air about it. Right. Okay, that, that's, that's all. That, like, shit away, my friend. It's your show. Oh, I will. Go <laughs> Dude, just, just, meanwhile, oh. meanwhile, I'm leaving names out of people who don't give a shit about anybody. That's <laughs> And don't worry, Bert's never going to hear this. So I, I'm sure people checked out an hour ago. How long have we been doing this? Almost two hours. Oh, that's not bad. That's, no. that's typical. That's average time. Thanks for anybody who stuck around. I, it really is um, the first time I've in the last. I surfed, and you don't really talk much to people, but it's it, yeah, it's really. I haven't been doing shows. I'm getting a, a spot maybe once every two weeks until everything gets back to fucking normal. So this was. I thank you for uh, inviting me over here. Hey, I've been wanting to have you on for a couple of years now. Like yeah. I'm, I've been a shit friend and been like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like when we met at LA Pop Festival, like we exchanged numbers, like, oh, yeah, we'll have you on. And like that was 2017. And <clears throat> look, again, I don't, don't, you know, you had a little technical difficulty. I've been in the game, I've been in podcasting a long time. Don't worry about it. I get it. I know. I've had, you know, I, I'm sure, of course, I want to do it. You just, you just can't, you know, a lot of times the stars take a while to line up, but they always do. They, oh, no. It was great. It was absolutely like, oh, yeah, finally get to fucking have Murray on. Fuck. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing my own sober, uh, to October, which has lasted two years. <laughs> it's okay. I can have more whiskey for me. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And trust me, I don't want to, I don't, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to fucking wake up 
and then I ended up homeschooling, which I didn't even see coming. Like I did homeschooling was a fucking nightmare for everybody involved. Even the teachers, when the teachers had to zoom in. Oh God. Like I, I couldn't get mad at them because they didn't fucking, they didn't. I know. Look, I'm a comic. They have no training in this. Yeah, I'm a comic. I know how that doesn't translate to Zoom. I'm sure teachers. I didn't get into comedy to do it on Zoom. As a matter of fact, I refused to do any fucking Zoom stand-up shows because they're death. So I can't blame the teachers. They didn't get into it. And I know a lot. I know a bunch of teachers who retired. Like, oh, this is how we're doing it. I was supposed to retire in four years. I'm retiring this year. So a lot of a lot of them didn't come back, and it was just it was just a nightmare for everybody, man. They were like, not not like it hasn't been a nightmare for everybody in the states for the last two years, anyway. In all honesty, like, I hate to say it, and some people will make it mad at me about this. The pandemic's actually been not so bad for me. Oh, in what way? Uh, I've definitely improved, like, technical skills and, like, editing and shit like that. There you though. go. Awesome. Like, my, I, it gave me more time to, like, actually work on content. So. Yo, good for you. I, <laughs> I did the opposite. I retired my podcast. But, Why did you retire the podcast, by the way? Okay. I, I wanted to get back on that. Okay. Let, well, and also I should, since I'm going to spend two hours talking about myself, I should talk about my new show at one point. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about the death and now the rebirth of the new show. Okay. Uh, 11 years, dude. It, it was a long time. It was, um, I talked to just about everybody I wanted to talk to. And it, it, it was hard to, it was hard to get ex- stay excited about it. It, was, it ran its course and it did. Excellent things for me. It, it got me into festivals. It got me headlining clubs. I wasn't headlining before. I met great people. I, I met and became friends with idols that, that I got into stand-up because of. You know, I got to be part of All Things Comedy and go to the All Things Comedy Festival, which was the best festival I'd ever done. And, and it just ran its course. I just think I got written up in USA Today. You know, it just, it just ran it. I just, it just ran its course. 11 years. We all can't be the Simpsons. You know what? You got to eventually... You know, um, and now we drink, we'll go down and it'll morph into something else. Eh, only when my liver fails. Well, it's still gonna, it's still gonna, it's still gonna go. <laughs> I, I, I will have to run out of life experiences and alcohol for it to uh, ever really, yeah. truly fucking end. Like all I do is fucking bullshit about what's going on with me. Worse comes to worse. Well, there you go. I thank God it's so entertaining though. It works out. Aw. Well, Aww. Uh, Aww, I'm they- lying. I never listen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know you listen. And you actually like reference shows, so you, you listen. Yeah, I want to listen to my friend Sally Mullins. I haven't I, I saw her on the thing and I haven't I haven't I haven't listened to it yet. And I've known Sally for twenty years easily. Sally was a super fun episode. She's what the hell is that? A stupid alert that is going out in post. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've known Sally for 20 years. She's fantastic. She's so, we used to fucking, I used to, she's so funny, man. I used to sit in the back of the room with my girlfriend at the time, same girl uh, from that story. We used to sit and just fucking, she had such, she's so funny, man. She's so funny. She's so great. Yeah, I wanted to check out. I was going to listen to her episode on the way over, but I had to make a phone call. <laughs> Priorities. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll still be there for you. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> but what is the new show? Oh, uh, the new show is called For What It's Worth, and it's a music and comedy game show. And uh, it's, I took, I, I watched all those Zoom episodes, all those Zoom shows, and, I'm, and I was like, I want to do the opposite of that. I don't want this to be stand up, stand up is death. Um, I, I did. I even, I even got a director, Darren Ewing. Thank you very much. He sent me all this equipment, uh, monitors, uh, uh, fucking teleprompters cameras lights i put up a backdrop in my th- and like and i tried to do this myself and it was it took a month of pre-production to realize i don't know how to fucking do any of this like i don't know you know i've show run but i've hired the guy to light it i've hired the guy to to set the camera i've hired the i can't do all that so i fucking stripped it back down <laughs> after i decided to stop making the citizen kane of zoom shows but it looks good I, I cashed in a lot of tv favors for graphics my buddy brett mcvicker did the graphics on it and it's music and comedy it's uh, it's trivia uh trivia about music and um and games all based on music. And, um, I've had great comics like Jimmy Pardo on Will Anderson. I just taped out of Australia, a comic out of Australia, JJ Whitehead, who's on the road with Jim Jeffries. And, uh, I got some rock a Canadian rock, uh, journalist on this season. And I got another one coming up. I hate to say who's going to be on because of all the technical difficulties. I've lost a few shows. So as it as slated it, says they're, they're slated on. So yeah, yeah I, I know how that goes. I got Damien Fahey from MTV's TRL coming on next week. I got, you know, a lot TRL's of still a thing. No, from TRL back in the day. Oh, so, so. <laughs> 
from, I only just got the email from him today. That's why I remember that. So I got a lot of a really, it's really super fun. And it's really funny. And, and the, the, the music trivia part is kind of like the underlie. It's all about the comedy and, and, and all that. So a lot of great comics on and a lot of good musicians. And it's fine. You can get it at, on YouTube, Murray Valeriano for what it's worth. And uh, I, I also lease an audio version on podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> I was thinking on the way over, I should do a metal show, a metal episode an all metal episode and get you on and, and like some metal heads and like, you know, I got some people that might be fun to have on there. Like, um, we can talk about it off air. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Some, uh, some band dudes I could reach out to. Cause I've had, I had some on my old road stories podcast. I had some old punk rockers and some old metal guys. And one, one metal guy I wanted to ask got into a little bit of trouble this past year. So I wasn't able to ask him. Oh, I'm off air. I guess I want to know. Yeah. I'm not going to say, what it is, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but off air, I but I would love to do an all metal episode. That would be fantastic. Actually, that's not a bad idea. I, I will prove how little I actually know about the genre I profess to like, be a part of. <laughs> I'll like, make it all about that Exodus t-shirt you're wearing. Awesome. <laughs> what size is that Exodus t-shirt you're wearing? Too small. It's too <laughs> small. <laughs> too small is correct, sir. Too small is correct. <laughs> that's what I've been thinking. All the fucking COVID weight. Ah. <laughs> that's why the laptop should have blocked my angle. Oh, man. It's, I mean, it's surprising. Like, not everybody has come out of this thing. It's so funny. Either, like, I see these people who were heavy going in and now they're ripped and I see people who are in really good shape and now they're not like it's, it's all depends on the direction you took, man. I was, in, and there's an argument for both sides. I was in shit shape before going <laughs> in and it only got worse. <laughs> I, I literally, cause I went into a, like a suit and tie security gig on Friday. Uh-huh. I had to go buy a new suit this week. Oh no. Oh, I'm a oh, dude. I haven't worn pants. I went to court in November. That might've been the only time I wore button pants. what did you have to go to court for? Uh, a ticket. Uh, I ran through a red light. No, I ran through a stop. I know when I say I ran through, I blew through a stop. But I went in, <laughs> I went in because this was during COVID. And I'm like, oh, I'm not working. I'm going to go in and get community service. Or I was going to, oh, I remember. I was going to play the COVID card because I hadn't worked because I don't know about your security jobs or anything like that. But the second they mentioned COVID, my calendar was empty. Like the calls just came in. Yeah, we're canceling. Yeah, we're canceling. Uh, November, we're canceling. I'm like, it's March. We're canceling. Like we're, until we know anything further. So my calendar got wiped. So I went in thinking, oh, I'm going to play the COVID card. I haven't worked in eight months. I, f- I rolled through a stop sign. What's the big thing? And so it gave me fucking community service. So I'm like, all right, I'll take community service. I'm not doing anything. And uh, and then uh, I go to sign for community service everybody's taking community service. So I couldn't get community service. Like every time I'd call, they're like, call back in a month. And then I call again and call back in a month. We got to call back because half the community service you couldn't do because of COVID anyway. So all your options are down to maybe like five things. And then everybody wants to do it because nobody can afford to pay their tickets. What are the five things? Cause I only <coughs> have to do six hours of community service before November. Oh, you know what you do? Go to, uh, go. I, I ended up doing, uh, um, uh, out of the closet in West Hollywood. Uh, which is, uh, they're tied into it and that's the one that's open. And apparently that's the popular one too. And you just go and you fold clothes for six hours and it's great. Eat a gummy, <laughs> you know, it's great. And it, that's, that's what I ended up doing. But I literally down to the point of, I had to do it. I had four days left and I finally got through and they're like, go. And so, and so I went, so I just did folded clothes it out of the closet, but it's very funny though. Like apparently it's a big, like I figured, Oh, maybe I'll slip this guy 20 bucks and. <laughs> You know, he'll sign my card and I'll get out of here, you know, but no, it's very, he took it very seriously. Like, what's your name? Give me your ID. You, you, you came in at 659. So you can leave at 459. You can't leave. You get 15 minutes. If you take one minute over, I'm tacking it on your thing. Like it's very, very regimented. Yeah. I may just pay the fine then. (laughs) It's only 300 bucks. I may just. (laughs) All right. But I, I also did it because I wasn't. I wasn't doing anything. Like I, I can't write jokes if I'm not doing something. You know, I have got nothing to pull from my. I'm like, maybe I'll get a bit out of it. I'll fucking do it. Well, and that's the my thought process too. Is like it might be something I can talk about on the fucking. Podcast. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And the funny thing is, like, I tried to be my usual lovable self, which you guys have noticed on the last two hours. <laughs> my usual charming, flirty self, and the people who actually work there. Like, I have no interest in the fucking, uh, no interest in the community service people. I'm like trying to strike up conversations with there. They're like, yeah, you're supposed to be folding clothes. Can you excuse me? Please? <laughs> like, they have no, in- because you figure you get 30 new people a week coming in and out of there, of various crimes that they have to, pay. I, they gotta be fucking so sick of like, oh, this community service labor 
probably not the best. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, I, I used to do, I used to do retail, so I was having fun like doing displays and stuff, like doing stupid displays and stuff like that. But you know, no, no, but the other guy was like, when can I get out of here? Is this, and you're like, can I have a smoke break, smoking joints in the back and stuff. So yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't get the most inspired people to creme work, de la creme of to work at a really good, you know, I mean, it does a lot of good stuff for the, for the AIDS community and, and, and the LGBT community. I sadly have some beef with AHF. So, Oh really? Mm-hmm. They're very anti-porn. Wait, who's anti-porn? AHF who owns out of the closet. H A F the AIDS healthcare foundation. Oh, are they really? Mm-hmm. Oh man. That's just, about to the, this up. now this is interesting. They're the, some of the biggest proponents of mandatory condoms in porn. Okay. They are also, during the last round of elections, were using funds that are supposed to be earmarked for AIDS, you know, healthcare, towards housing bills and shit like that. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not defending them, but that happens in every fucking bill, though. You know what I mean? That happens in every... Yeah, but you're a nonprofit. Like, yeah. You're specifically a nonprofit because mm-hmm. you're supposed to be directing those funds towards AIDS healthcare. Sure, yeah. No, I'm listening. And, I'm not... Like I said, and if I'm you're going after them. fucking pornographers for wearing condoms and fucking porn, mm-hmm. they put forth Prop 60... Mm-hmm. Which almost killed the industry in fucking California. Oh, interesting. I remember that, but it, it, it didn't pass. That pass. It did yeah. fail, right? Yeah, the 2016 election was wild. It was like, we were expecting Hillary to win and Prop 60 to pass, and it went it, polar oh. opposite. <laughs> polar opposite. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. I know I have a few friends in the porn uh, industry, but I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs of it. So um, that's interesting. Yeah, but I do know that that failed. Thankfully, but it's still, you can still get an OSHA violation for shooting porn without a condom in. California. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, my friends are fine. What's an OSHA violation? Like, you know, work, occupational work care OSHA. Like, oh, okay. The okay. same people that like, yeah, you yeah. Know, if you're not wearing a hard hat, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. they could show up on a porn set. I thought OSHA meant, I thought it was a different. No, no, different same OSHA. Thing. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Like I have friends have been fined like $80,000 for condoms not being used in porn. Wow. 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 So it's still, is it mandatory? It's not mandatory. Technically by the letter of the law it is. Okay. Uh, well, know, are they raiding sets though, or rarely? But it happens on occasion. <laughs> okay. Generally, it, you know, someone gets disgruntled and whistle blows, and then uh-huh. OSHA shows up. They, Somebody makes too much noise in the house next door, and they call the right. Or you know, occasionally it's former performers that are disgruntled. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Unfortunately, porn has a lot of turnover. Yeah, I would imagine it does. And not everyone leaves the industry on the best terms. Yeah, man. I music, comedy, and. <laughs> adult films the fucking internet killed right or it took a big damage out of anyway yeah oh and porn worse than music and movies because there's no riaa defending porn in congress yeah yeah like no one is going to be able to successfully start suing people like the riaa did over pirated porn yeah yeah that makes sense hell the biggest player in the game right now got you know really made it from stealing other people's content and then monetizing it on tube sites yeah how does it because i had a uh an adult actress slash comedian on my podcast and we talked a little bit about it was it sally or no it was a different one and uh i don't like to t- talk about people's names for some reason i don't know I, I don't know like on public that you talk to on public forums that's weird all right well but i know i know and you know her she's on your show oh, and, and, but yeah and uh yeah and i was like how does that work like i, I and she explained it to me and, and like and then like who was with some, I forget who was with. They brought up a site and so it was like, Oh yeah, that's me. And like, she didn't know if she was on that site. I think if I remember that correctly. So I don't know how that must've really took a big dent out of the adult industry. Yeah. It's super fucked up. Yeah. It's crazy to think that like Pornhub browsers is all under a parent company. Okay. And that company 100% made its mark in the industry by stealing other people's content. Really? And now they are the biggest name in the game. And I, man, yeah, how do you, and you can't police that really, can you? You should be able to, because it's still copyright violations. Sure. But at the end of the day, you're going to be fighting a giant in court. Oh, really? Is it, is it like, and is it like the d- ticket master of adult entertainment? I mean, it is these days. And at, there were points where one of their sister sites, like if you put, you filed a DCMA MA strike, like, you know, that's a violation of they were putting up people's addresses that filed the complaint. Ugh, They'd what? put the complaint instead of the link. Really? Yeah. So yeah. like, you know, say there was a Ver- Murray Valeriano scene. Right. You have to, you know, as part of the. You're complaint. welcome. There isn't. <laughs> we're all thankful for this. 
but me and yeah. Como Esta are going to do something <laughs> after the show. <laughs> you know, when you file the complaint, it has you know Murray Valeriano address, all that. They put they full on doxed people. Really, dude, that's that lame. were putting, that were you know like, hey, that's my content. Take it down. Wow. Wow. Yeah, man. Uh, allegedly, don't sue me. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly, that was happening. Please okay. don't sue me. All right, that's because I don't have much, and I mm-hmm. like to keep what I have. Yeah, I don't understand how uh, in the, uh, the adult film, uh, and especially performers, are, are making their money. I don't. Only fans. Yeah. Which and almost which almost went under, right? Or yeah, almost made banned. the worst business decision in like the history of business decisions. Right? <laughs> Hold on, I'm flying in my private jet because of adult content. Let's get rid of that. Right. Let's let's give it to bands nobody's ever heard of. Yeah, that's that's just from and a C-list entertainers that like, you know, want to make other content. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a poor business decision, I would imagine. And the thing about it is they temporarily you know, suspended those plans. But- uh uh-huh. They didn't say they were canceling them, so it may still happen. Oh, really? Oh, all right. Talking to a lot of people about this, like, people should be looking for other avenues. Yeah. Now, I, I, and I don't, I'm, I've am i never been on OnlyFans. Is there other content on OnlyFans? There is. One but of, it's, but on, it's just known for adult content. It is now, but it was originally launched as, like, a kind of a Patreon competitor to, like, oh, yeah, have sure. more access to other entertainers and shit like that. Yeah, yeah. And then it never explicitly denied adult content so it just became a platform for adult content and part of the problem was because they weren't initially intended to be an adult site Uh they didn't have a lot of regulations and things Uh, in place that they needed to be for adult site and that's where a lot of the problems are coming in now because mastercard back in april said if you're doing adult content these are the regs that you have to fucking follow and they just didn't have the shit in place and for whatever reason felt like it would be a headache. Um, a comedian slash former adult performer, Kate Kennedy, does a whole video that she just put out about it that's actually really informative. I'd be more comfortable if you didn't use names. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Too late. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Too late. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Kate Kennedy. Kate Kennedy. Kate Kennedy. <clears throat> Do you know Kate? I don't know Kate. I, I scrolled, When I was scrolling through your podcast, I saw her name. I know the name. I don't know her personally. Um yeah, it's so weird that, and they're still doing that with marijuana too. Like you can't use certain credit cards at marijuana uh, dispensaries in California. You can't. Somebody was telling me who owns a dispensary. Like it's it's almost like Breaking Bad. They're all they're so cash fluid. They have to be because of it's a, still a federal Schedule One drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all fucked up, man. Just change everything already, and just fuck. It's inevitably going to change. Just fucking change it. But we seem to be going backwards. Oh, we're going to get into politics. Shit. No, no, we're not. <laughs> no, no, no. We're just going to walk away. Yes, change that shit. Yeah. I want to be able to PayPal my fucking marijuana if I want marijuana, and I want them to decriminalize fucking shrooms so I can like. They're decriminalizing Colorado, aren't they? And Oregon. And or- of course, Oregon. Yeah, yeah. And Oakland. Oh, they are. Yep. Yeah, microdosing is a big, uh, big thing. I yeah, tried yet. Fuck that macrodose. Well, it's for the moms at my kids' school. <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> they can macrodose too. Like yeah. that's what I said. They're, that's the ones that they microdose at uh, my mom at the school. That's the uh. West Side. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I'm just dropping Timmy off in the carpool lane, and then I'm gonna go m- microdose. You know, <laughs> go microdose before my yoga class. My hot yoga class. It has to be a hot yoga. They, they don't fucking do yoga. They just wear the pants. <laughs> Nobody ever leaves. God bless. Them. No, absolutely. Nobody ever leaves and actually goes and does yoga and those things. <laughs> does anyone actually ever do yoga? Like, do those studios ever? Does anyone ever go? Uh, not, now they're all online. My wife's a big yogi, um, but they fucking took a hit too. The yoga, you know. But now again, I'm like, I'm looking at these guys. I'm like, why would you go? The one good thing about the pandemic is it really showed light on a lot of bullshit we don't have to deal with. Like why, like I'm looking at these yoga instructors who are charging 10 bucks a head, getting a hundred people and doing six show, uh, show six, you know, classes a day and they're not having to pay You're right the first time their shows. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay. And they're not having to pay the studio or anything. I'm like, why would you ever go back and teach in a studio and give 40, 50, 60% of what you're making? You know what I mean? I, I think, I think that's one thing the pan, you know, a lot of people working from home, you know, they don't need to be. I know it's going to kill us in the writer's room because I, I know some fucking network's going to, like everything's going to lift. And you're like, you know what? We can actually save money if the writers stay at home. But you need the you need comedy writers in a writer's room. I think that's, that's going to be one down. You, you guys can't do it from a comedy Zoom? 
Dude, it blows. Like you need the energy. You know, you've been around comedy enough. You know, you've you've done shit. You like you need that energy in the room. You need to feed off each other. Oh, no. you know? And it doesn't translate if you got a fucking bad connection. I one hundred percent agree. The last year and a half of me doing remote podcasts has been hell on earth. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, dude, I did. I was so bummed. I did never not funny again uh, a couple months ago, and for some reason my fucking internet kept going out. And I just changed to fucking Fios, the best internet you can get. And it was, and I was like, so I'm like, oh, this blows, man. It sucks so bad. Even if you have good internet, there's just something about body language, energy that only really happens in person. A hundred percent. You're preaching to the choir. Agreed. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Like this would have been uh, a very boring two hours if we did it from if I did it from my west side. And now it's only slightly boring. It's true. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been nodding off. Half, half <laughs> I thought it was the scotch. Speaking of nodding off, I do have to go home at one point. Well, let's call last call on this motherfucker and get you out of here. Yeah, let's call last. Who is this blowing up my phone right now? All right. Anyway, sorry. I have no updates on our friends, though, which I'm going to say no news is good news. I agree. Okay. I agree. Bad podcast decor. Fucking pulling out your phone, though. Oh, I forgot we're on video. <laughs> <laughs> Murray. I'm out, I'm out of the loop, buddy. I'm, 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 I'm still in COVID shape. I got to get the fucking patina off. Got to flex that muscle off, buddy. Got to flex that muscle off. Well, we're calling last call on this motherfucker. All right. Where buddy. can they find you on the things? All right. Let's go to uh, at Murray V on Twitter and Murray V Comedy on Instagram and uh, check out for what it's worth. Uh, uh, YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Murray Valeriano comedy. Uh, if you like music and comedy, man, this is, this is right up your alley, dude. It's right up your alley. So check it out. And, uh, you know, if you like it, hit me up. I, I try to return every email I get. Hell yeah. And the socials socials, uh, at Murray V on Twitter, uh, Murray V comedy on Instagram. I have a TikTok. Oh my God. You have a TikTok. I have a TikTok. I don't really, I only use it for the show though. I only use it for the show. And, uh, that's it. I don't know what the TikTok is. That's because I only use it for the show and we're on hiatus. I'm oh, new episodes. Hopefully what's the date here? I'm up in September 20th. Well, the new episodes and all great comics. I got great comics, music journalists, musicians lined up. Very excited about it. And a mediocre podcaster coming soon. Oh yeah. We're going to do an all metal episode. I'm in. I'm so fucking <laughs> in. But as always, you can find me at Matt underscore Slayer on Twitter, Matt Slayer on Instagram, Matt F and Slayer on Facebook, twitch.tv slash Matt F and Slayer. You can find the podcast at, and now we drink on Twitter and now we drink underscore on Instagram. And until next week, drink up motherfuckers. <laughs>